In this video, I'm gonna show you how to build a fully functional e-commerce site that has purchase workflows, emails, admin pages, literally everything that you need in an e-commerce site. This includes it. And best of all, this is the smallest amount of code that you could possibly write to actually get this functionality. You can see we have things like authentication for our admin pages. We have authentications for our users. You can see we have a dashboard here that it contains all the different information we need, as well as ways to like edit, deactivate, download products, file uploads, image uploads. This is literally every single thing you would need to get started with an e-commerce project. And like I said, it's the smallest amount of code possible. The reason this is really important is because you actually want to minimize the amount of code that you write so you can spend more of your time on the actual products and the implementation and design of your site. So this is the quickest way for you to get up and running with an e-commerce site. If you've ever worked on a software development team before, you know that Slack is one of the best tools out there for collaborating and communicating with other developers. But Slack is actually raising the bar even higher by integrating in Slack apps. These Slack apps can be built through a drag and drop workflow builder, or you can actually write them entirely from scratch using code, which is my preferred method. And the really great thing about this is they allow you to integrate things into Slack that you would normally need to create custom tooling for. Things like the ability to directly translate messages inside a Slack or have a system for requesting time off or even managing your stand-up meetings or anything else you can think of on even a larger scale. It's really endless what you can do with this. And the best part is, is most companies when they build this, they really focus on non-technical users, but Slack knows that technical users are their main customer. So they're really focusing on things like adding in a CLI, which lets you manage all of your different apps. And they even have their own developer program that you can join. And this developer program is really great because it has tons of great documentation and videos and events all about Slack apps and everything around it. And on top of that, they have a full developer sandbox where you can spin up your own version of Slack with all of the most premium features to be able to test out all of the different apps that you're building. If this sounds interesting, you're definitely gonna to wanna to click on the link in the description to sign up for the developer program and start building your own Slack apps. Thank you very much to Slack for sponsoring this video. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplify. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. Now for this e-commerce site, we're gonna be using the latest Next.js with server actions and server components. We're also gonna be using Prisma for our database and we're gonna be using Tailwind for our styling. Now you don't have to use these tools, but I find them to be the easiest and quickest tools to get up and running with. So to create a Next app, we can type in npx create Next app at latest. And we're gonna say we want to use TypeScript, ESLint, Tailwind, source directory, and the app router, and then just leave everything essentially as the default. Once that's done, it'll install everything over here for us. And as you can see, we have all of our different files and we can run npm run dev if we wanted to start this up. Now, the very first thing I wanna do is get our database set up inside of our application because it's much easier to do at the beginning rather than trying to add it in later. And we're gonna be using Prisma so I can go through the getting started documentation for Prisma and it's relatively straightforward. First, we need to make sure we have all these different libraries installed. So if we look inside of our package JSON, you can see we already have the node and TypeScript libraries installed. So the only thing we actually need is this TS node library. So we can just say npm i dash dash save dev TS node. And that's gonna make sure we have that package installed as well. The next thing that we need to do if we scroll down a little ways here is how do we actually set up Prisma? So we can just copy this command, which is going to install Prisma for us as a dev dependency because we only need it in development. It'll actually compile the production version for us. So that's why we're only installing this for development. Then what we can do is we can make sure that we initialize NPX with Prisma. And this is just going to be setting us up with a SQLite database. Now it doesn't really matter what database you use. We're just using a SQL database. And the reason I'm using SQLite is because it doesn't require you to download anything additional since it's all packaged in with Prisma. Now in the process of doing that, you'll notice that we'll get a couple files over here. We'll get our .env, which contains our database URL. This is just whatever the URL to your database is. And as you can see, that points to inside of our Prisma. That's where this .dev DB is going to be. So inside of here, we have our schema. And this schema is where we define all of our different models like you can see here. So I wanna set up all the different models we're gonna be using for our e-commerce site. If we look over here, you can kind of see a general idea of the models we need. We need a model for our different customers. We need a model for all of our different sales, as well as for our different products. And then we also finally need a model for downloading these products because the way that this e-commerce site works is it's going to be a digital download site. So you're going to buy something and then you're going to be getting sent a link to actually download that. So we need a table in our database to store those different download verification links. So only the correct people can download these products and we can make sure that the links actually expire after a certain period of time, just to make sure that no one's getting anything for free or sharing links around. So that's just gonna make this as secure as we can. So let's go ahead and actually create our models. We just say model and whatever the name of that model is, we'll get started with the product model because that's going to be probably the most straightforward model we have. 
First of all, we want to have an ID. I'm gonna make this a UUID. So we're gonna say it's gonna be a string at ID. And the default for this is gonna be UUID. Now, instead of making you actually watch me type all this out, I'm gonna paste in what all of our different fields are gonna be. And then I'm gonna explain to you exactly why we're using each one of these. So we have our ID, pretty self-explanatory. The name of our product is obviously just the name. We're gonna be storing the price in cents just because that's how Stripe is going to use the price. So it's gonna be easy to integrate with Stripe, which we're gonna use for payments. And also because that way you don't have to worry about any rounding errors or anything like that. It's just always stored in pennies. Then we're gonna have a file path. This is the path to the thing that is going to be downloaded. So whenever we create a new product, we're going to upload a file with that that the thing is going to be downloaded. It's so like a zip file, for example, or a video file. And we're also gonna upload an image to go along with it to show on the website. So this is just pointing to both of those different locations. Then we have a description describing what it is. We have this Boolean flag determining if the product is available for purchase. This is a really important flag because let's say that someone buys a product, we'll call that product A, and then later down the road, we decide we no longer want to sell product A. Well, we could just delete that product entirely, but by doing that, the person that already purchased product A now no longer is able to download the product that they bought because we deleted it. So by just making it so that something is no longer available for purchase, we're able to keep that product available to download for people that already purchased it, but it won't show up on our site for sale anymore. This is also a great way to have like in progress products that aren't quite ready yet. You can create all the information, keep it unavailable until it's actually ready to go. Then finally, we have created at and updated at fields just to keep track of any changes inside of our model. Now the next model we want is going to be our user model, and this is for our different customers. We're just gonna call it user, but you could call it whatever you want. So this is also going to have the exact same ID property, which is going to be a UUID by default. Then we're gonna have a email here. So we're gonna say string, and this is going to be unique. So we're gonna make sure we flag it as at unique. And then we're gonna have our same created at and updated at fields inside of here. Now our user is going to be a very simple thing inside of our project, just because we don't actually have to worry about username, passwords, or anything like that, because everything is going to be taken care of through email. So we don't have to worry about any password-based authentication. It's gonna be as simple as possible. Now, if you want to, in the future, add more advanced authentication, that's super easy to add onto this project. I tried to make this project as modular as possible. So being able to add things onto it is incredibly easy, but it's not going to be full of a bunch of stuff you don't need. It's gonna be the bare bones minimum, which is really important. Now that's all we need to do for our user. So let's go on to our order model. And this is just to keep track of which products, which users bought. So essentially it's just linking the two together as well as a little bit of additional information. So here I'm gonna copy over everything we need for our order. As you can see, we have our ID, pretty self-explanatory. We have created at and updated at. But the one thing that's a little bit interesting is we also have the price paid here as well. That's because let's say our product sells for $10 and our user buys it for $10. And then a year from now, we actually increase the price to $20. We want to make sure we keep track of what price the user paid at the time they purchased it for all of their different receipt purposes and for our own tracking purposes as well. That's why we have the price that they paid inside of the order so we know how much this individual product cost them. Then we're also linking to the user that purchased that as well as the product that they purchased. Now, in order to make sure we link up all of our foreign keys and everything properly, Prisma has a really easy way to do that. We can just say we're gonna have a user property, which is going to be of type user, which is the same name as this model right here. And we can say that this is going to be a relation. And now we can specify what the fields are for this relation. So this essentially is saying the ID is our user ID, which is what that fields property is for. And we're saying it references the ID field in our user table. So up here in our user table, this ID is mapping to this user ID right here. And then we can determine what we want to do whenever we delete this. So we can say on delete, if we delete one of our users, well, we want to delete all the orders associated with them. So we're gonna pass in this cascade flag. All that is saying is if we delete a user, delete all of the orders associated with that user. Now, the reason this is showing an error is because we also need to add our order up into here. So each user is going to have multiple orders. So we're gonna say it's going to be an array of different orders, just like that. And it's actually just called order, there we go. Now we can do the exact same thing with our product. So this will be called product. It's going to be of type product. And the field here is our product ID, which references our ID. Now in this case, if we have an order for a product, we do not want to be able to delete that product because like I said, the user will no longer be able to download the product they already purchased. So instead of deleting the order, if we delete the project or the product, we're gonna actually restrict this. And essentially that's just saying that if we try to delete a product that has orders, it will not allow us to do that, which is really important for making sure we keep the integrity of our database and to make sure users can still download their products. Now up here inside of our product, let's make sure we add a field for our orders, which is just gonna be a type of order array, just like that. Now we have everything linked up together. Now this is pretty much all the models we need, but I'm gonna add one additional model to keep track of all of our different download links. So I'm gonna come in here, we're gonna call this download verification. Make sure I spell model correctly. There we go. 
And inside this download verification, it's going to be pretty similar to what we have up here. I'm going to copy all of this. So we're going to have our ID, we're going to have our created at, and we're going to have our updated at. But here, instead, I'm actually going to put an expires at, and we'll make this a date time just like that. And I can actually remove this updated at flag because we should never need to actually update this particular model. So now you can see here we have our ID, which is just a simple string. We have a date that we created this download verification and we have a date for when this should actually expire. So we can make sure that they only last for 10 minutes or an hour or a day or however long we want these to last for. Now all we need to do is link to what product we're actually allowing you to download with this particular link. So we're going to have a product ID, which is a string. And then we're going to have a product. So I'm going to copy this straight from here. And in this case, if we delete a product, I don't care if we delete the actual verification links for this. So I'm just going to set this as cascade, essentially saying if we delete a product, delete all of the different download links associated with it as well. And then up inside of our product, we can just say our download verifications is going to be download verification array. And that should hopefully clean up all of our different errors. So if I just make this a little bit easier to see by collapsing down all of this, you can see we have a table for all of our individual products. We have a table for each of our customers. We have a table for every order that individual customers make. So linking up our products and our users. And then we have a table for creating links that allow us to download individual products. And we're just saying this link lasts for X amount of time and it's for one particular product. So anyone that has this particular ID is able to download a product for a given period of time based on what is inside this table. Now, the next step is going to be actually populating our database with these new tables. So if we look at the quick stock documentation and I scroll down here, you can see that this is line right here, which is just for actually creating a migration for all of our data. So NPX Prisma Migrate Dev, give it whatever name you want. We're just calling it init. And as you can see, it's going through the process and it should run everything that we need to actually get up and started with our database. It's going to be creating our database, creating our tables, creating our migration, and it's going to be creating some production code for us that has all of the different functions we need to interact with our database. So now if we actually look at our files, you'll notice that we have this dev.db, which contains our actual database, as well as a migrations folder, which contains the migration to add all of those different tables to our database. So everything we need for our database is now set up, which is great. Now the next step for us is to actually start working on pages, which are going to use and consume our database. And to get started, I want to work on the admin pages first, that way we have a way to actually add new products and so on to be able to populate our database before we actually go to our customer facing pages next. Now to create the UI for our application, I'm using Tailwind, like I said, but I'm also gonna be using Shad CN, which is essentially a library built on top of Tailwind that has a bunch of really handy components for us to use. As you can see over here, we have a bunch of different components being listed and they're all really useful and really well tested. So what we can do to actually get started with this is just run this command right here, npx shad cn ui and latest, and we want to initialize. All this is going to do is get us set up with a few different files that are going to be used inside of shad cn. It's going to ask us quite a few questions. I'm just going to leave everything pretty much default. So we'll say default, our color will be slate, we'll use CSS variables, and then it's going to go through and initialize everything for us. So if we look at our code, you can see it's made a few different changes to our Tailwind config. It's added this components.json, which is just used by shad cn. And inside of our source, you can see it's added this utils file with just this single cn function, which makes it easy to merge to together different classes names. Now the final thing we need to do to get Shad CN to work properly is just to make sure we hook up the fonts properly inside of this. So we're just going to go through and use this exact code right here. So if we go into our actual app folder here and we go down to our layout, this is where you can see Next.js has a bunch of stuff set up for us for like the inter font and so on. All we need to do is make sure that we add this section for variable. So we can say our variable and we can call it dash dash font sans just like that. And then if we scroll down here a little ways, you can see that this class name is applying all of that different information. So what we can do is we can make sure we add all the different classes we want inside of here. So for our class names, what we want to do is we want to have a background, which is going to be our background color. So we're going to say BG background. Our minimum height is going to be screen, just so we make sure it fills the full height. Our font is going to be that sans font. We're going to specify anti-aliasing. And then we need to make sure we add in that font sans variable. So to do that, we're going to be using that CN function that was added by the shad cn so make sure we get cn just like that and for the second parameter inside of here we're going to pass our font sans which in our case is called inter dot variable just like that and make sure we close that off so now that's adding all the different classes we need to get our background color set up right as well as to get our font set up right the last thing we need to do is to actually change our theme to use that particular variable so what we can do is we can go inside of our tailwind config and make sure that we find the section for our theme that we want to extend. So we're inside of theme, inside of extend here, I'm gonna change our font family. And I'm gonna say that our font family is just going to be equal to our sans font, just like that. And we want this to be our variable 
for font sans, which is the thing that we created with Next.js. And then we wanna add in all the other font family related stuff for sans. So what we can do is we can actually import that. So we can just come to the very top of our file and say import font family. And that's going to be coming from tailwind CSS slash default theme, just like that. Make sure I spell that correctly. And it, there we go, now it's spelled correctly. And we should see all of our errors go away. And essentially it's just adding the inter font to the beginning of our font list. So that'll work properly. So now to actually test if all of this is working, let's come in here and we'll just say NPM run dev. And hopefully our application will start up just fine. And if we open it up, you'll see that our application is loading on the right hand side of our screen, which is great. Now we have a bunch of default styles inside of here, which we really don't care about. So for now, I'm just going to come in here. I'm going to remove all of these default code and styles and everything. I'm just going to replace it with a single H1 that says hi, super straightforward, super simple. And now we can just get rid of all of that. And if you come in here and I zoom in a bunch, you can see we have the text high showing up and the font and the background color are all set up exactly like we want. If we were to change our background to like red 500, we should see that it is now going to have a red background. So at least we can see that everything is actually working. Now, as I mentioned, the very first thing I wanna work on is our admin pages. So inside of our app here, we can just add a brand new folder called admin, and that's where all of our admin pages are going to go. Also, we can remove this favicon. We could add our own if we really wanted. And same thing inside this public folder, we can get rid of these images. We don't actually need those. Those would be things you would add in yourself. Same thing here with this metadata, change it to whatever is based on your particular project. Now in this admin folder, let's create a brand new file inside of here called layout.tsx. I'm also going to create a page.tsx inside of here as well. This is going to be like our root dashboard. So inside of our layout, we'll say export default function. This is our admin layout, just like that. And this is going to be very similar to the layout that we have here. As you can see, it's going to be taking in some React children. So I'll just copy over the props since they're exactly the same props, just like that. And inside of here, if we wanted, we could just return our children. But of course, we want to wrap some stuff around this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a navigation component at the top here, which is going to be all of our nav stuff. And then I'm going to add in a div here with a class name of container and margin y of six. So it's going to make sure all of our content is centered and give it a little bit of space on the top and the bottom. And then I'm going to put my children inside of that. Now our nav is going to be a special component that we're going to create. So we're going to use this components folder right here. I'm going to create a brand new file called nav.tsx and we'll just say export function nav, just like that. Now this nav is going to be really super straightforward. It's just going to be a simple nav component and it's going to have some class names applied to it. And that's pretty much it. So we're going to say background is going to be our primary color, which in our case is a darkish black color. Our text is going to be our primary foreground color, which is a white color. We're going to just or set this as a flex container and we're going to justify everything in the center. Also, we're going to add a little bit of spacing around this. So there we go. Once we have that done, we can add in our children, which is the only prop this is going to take in. So we'll say children, and this is just going to be children, which is a react node, just like that. So that should clean everything up. So now we have our nav. And the next thing I want to do is create another function, which is going to be a component called nav link, which just allows us to add links to our nav really easily that are automatically going to have focus style applied to them based on what route we're on. So we're going to have our nav link inside of here. And this is going to work essentially identically to a normal link inside of Next.js. So we're going to have a link is what we're going to return, which is a Next.js component. And we're going to make sure we just close off that. And we're going to take in our props up here. And these props are going to be coming just from our component props for our link. So essentially, it's going to get all of the props for our link component. So type of link, just like that. But we want to make sure we omit the class name prop because we don't want to be able to add class names to this. So we're going to say that we are going to omit the class name prop from this. Make sure I spell that correctly. There we go. Just like that. So now I have these props and I can pass them in just like that. And then I can pass in my own custom class name. And we're going to, again, use that CN helper because I'm actually going to be getting the specific path that I'm on to add special classes if we're on the correct path. So I can say here, const path name is equal to the use path name hook. And since I'm using a hook, I need to make sure at the top of this file, I mark this as a client component by saying use client. So now I have access to whatever my specific path is, and now I can apply all of my default styles, which you can see here, if I zoom this out, are going to be just essentially a no background color or anything, but you can see that when I'm on the selected page, it has this different background color to it and everything like that. So by default, my classes are going to be a padding of four, just like that. I'm going to have a hover style where my background is going to be set to the secondary color and a hover where my text is going to be set to that secondary as well. So text, secondary foreground. There we go. 
Then I'm just gonna copy both of these styles because I wanna do the exact same thing when my focus is visible. So I'm gonna do focus visible and same thing here, focus visible, just like that. So that way, whether we're tabbed onto it or hovering over it, we're gonna get these specific styles. And let's make sure we import a CN up here to get rid of that error. And then finally down here, I'm just gonna say if my path name is equal to my props.href, so if we're on the current path that we're pointing to, well then I just wanna change my background. So I'll say that my background is going to be that background color, and then my text is going to be this foreground color just like that. So now if I give that a quick save, what we can do inside of our admin section is add in the import for nav, and we can also add in some nav links inside of here. So we can say nav link just like that. And let's say that this one is going to say dashboard. That's gonna be my first link. Then we're gonna have one for products. And I wanna make sure I add an href here for the homepage. This one is going to be slash admin slash products. And this one up here should actually say slash admin. There we go. Copy this down because this one is going to say users. And this one is gonna say orders. And the link text will say customers and sales, just like that. So now if I give that a quick save and I make this page actually do something, so we'll say export default function admin dashboard, return an h1 that just says dashboard. Super simple, super straightforward. There we go. So now if I give that a save and I actually start up my application and we'll just make sure we go to that page. So we'll just go to localhost 3000 admin. We'll close out of this older, older version. Now you can see that we have these links up here. And when I navigate around, obviously nothing works because they don't have links for these yet, but you can see my application is rendering, which is great. Now for this dashboard, I obviously don't wanna just render out the text dashboard. And instead I want to render out a grid with specific cards. You could make this as complex as you want with different charts and dashboards and all that. But in our case, we're gonna make it super simple and super straightforward. So here I'm gonna create a div. Class name is going to be grid. We're gonna say that by default on the smallest screen size, we have one column. On medium screen sizes, we're gonna go up to two columns. And on large screen sizes and above, we're gonna go up to three columns, just so it's going to be a little bit more responsive. And also inside of here, I'm gonna say that we're gonna have a gap of four. I need to make sure that I fix my typo here. There should be no space in between those. There we go. And now inside of here, I can create my different cards. To do that, again, I'm gonna be using Shad CN. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to Shad CN. I'm gonna search for the card component. And you can see we have the card component right here. And to install this is super straightforward. I just copy this one line of code and it's just going to copy this card component into my application. So once that runs, you'll notice in this components folder, I have this UI folder and inside of here contains all the code for the card. I could change this to make it my own custom card, but for our use cases, we want this to get up and running as quick as possible. So we're gonna pretty much use the default styles. I'm gonna restart my application and now I can actually use the card inside of here. So make sure I import that from the component slash UI slash card. There we go. And then inside this card, I want to have a header. So we're gonna get our card header inside of here. And this is going to be whatever the text you want to say. So in our case, we could say something like products or sales. Let's just say sales in our case, because that's gonna be the first thing in our dashboard. Then we're gonna have the card description. And this is going to be like a secondary section. So we'll just say description like this. We'll get the actual real value in here in just a little bit. I just wanna kind of show you what this is going to look like. Then after that, we need the card content. So we're gonna get that card content. And inside of here, we're just gonna put a paragraph that has whatever our text is. We'll just say text for now. So if I give this a quick save and I actually go over to our page and give it a refresh, we should actually see over here that this card shows up. As you can see, we have sales, we have a description and we have our text. Now it doesn't quite look correct. And that's because inside my card header, I should have a card title, which contains the text sales. So let's fix that. And then inside the headers where the description should be as well. Now you can see that my formatting is properly good, just like I want it to be. Now I'm gonna have three of these cards, so I could copy this down and paste it three times just like this, or what I could do is I could create a custom component instead. So let's create a component for this called dashboard card. And this dashboard card essentially takes in a title, it takes in a subtitle, and it takes in our body. So we're gonna have a title, a subtitle, and our body. And that is our dashboard card props. And let's create that type dashboard card props is equal to, we're gonna have a title, which is a string, and we're gonna have the exact same thing for our subtitle as well as our body. These are just gonna be three separate strings that we're passing in. And then we're just gonna return this exact content down here. So we'll say return, just like that. This will say title inside of our description, that'll be our subtitle. And then finally, inside of our paragraph tag, we will have our body just like that. 
And now up here, I can render out as many of those dashboard cards as I want and pass in, for example, my title, which is sales, the subtitle, which will just say test, and the body, which will say body for now. There we go. You can see that, that card looks great. And now I can copy this down and make it much easier and more modular to work with. Now, in my case, I want to get specific data to put inside of these cards, like how many sales have I made? How much money has my products earned me? So I'm going to create different functions to get that data. So we'll create a function here that's going to be called get sales data, just like that. And this is going to be coming directly from our database. Now, to be able to use our database inside of Next.js, we need to do a little bit of finagling of our code to actually get this to work. But luckily in the Prisma documentation, if you search for Next.js, so if I just come up to the very top here, search documentation for Next.js, you should see that there's going to be a page exactly on how to use this inside of Next.js. And there should be a troubleshooting section that tells you what you need to do. This actually isn't the correct page. So let me search for Next.js again to make sure I actually get the right page. So if I click on this second link right here, you can see that this gives me some code that I can use to actually get the client to work properly inside of my application. So I'm just gonna take this exact bit of code, copy it, and inside of my source folder, I'll create a brand new folder called DB. And inside of that, I'll create a file called db.ts and I'll paste in this code. All this code is doing is making sure that Prisma works well with Next.js because this is just making sure that they're hooked together. Now, instead of calling this Prisma, I'm actually gonna call this DB just because I like that naming of DB a little bit better. So we're gonna make sure that we change all of these different instances to say DB instead of Prisma. We'll do the same thing here. It doesn't really matter. DB and DB, just like that. There we go. Now we can actually use that by inside of here, just saying DB, importing that. And now we have access to everything from our database. So for example, we can query our orders table if we wanted to find all of our different orders. Now you will notice I got this question mark syntax. That's because it's using the global DB variable. So instead of calling this DB for the global variable, I'll call the global variable D Prisma. So this will be Prisma. And then our local variable will be called DB. That way we make sure we always import the proper DB variable. And now you can see it's no longer nullified. So now we have our order and we can do whatever we want with this. And in our case, what I want to do is I want to get the total amount of sales I've made as well as the total amount of money from those sales. So we'll use the aggregate function to essentially do a sum and a count. So what we'll do inside of here is we'll get a sum. And this sum is just going to sum together all the different prices that have been paid in cents. So I want to sum together the total price. And then I want to do a count and we'll just say true. And this is just going to count the number of rows in our database as well. So it'll give us the total number of sales as well as how much we've made in sales. So I'll just say const data is equal to that. And we'll make sure we await that because this is going to be asynchronous. And then I can return this data in a little bit more friendly format. So I'll just say return my amount. This is the amount that we've made in sales total. So that's data dot underscore sum. I want to get the sum of my price paid in cents, or we'll just set this to zero if we don't have any sales at all. And I'm gonna divide this by 100 to give me an actual dollar amount. So we'll divide it by 100, just like that. Then finally, we're gonna get the number of sales, which is just data dot underscore count. So this is just a little bit easier way to work with that data. Now down here, we can say sales data is equal to get sales data, just like that. Make sure we await this. And since we're using Next.js with server components, we can just do this directly inside of our server component. And I can even just destructure this out to be, for example, our amount, but we'll just leave it as sales data because that's a little bit easier to work with. And now inside of our subtitle, we can say that we wanna get our sales data dot, and let's in our case actually get the number of sales that we've done. And then for our body, we're gonna give us the sales data dot, and we're gonna get the amount of sales that we've actually done. So now if we give that a save and we come over here, you can see it says zero and zero. Obviously I want this to look a little bit better though and I wanna do different formatting. So we're gonna write some formatters and some extra code to make this look a little better. So inside of our actual lib folder here, our, we're gonna create a brand new file called formatters.ts. And I'm actually just gonna copy this code directly over because all this code does is create a formatter for formatting currencies and formatting numbers. It's just going to add in different commas, dollar signs, and so on inside of our code. It's very straightforward. I've covered this INTL object a bunch of times on my blog and such. I'll link to that if you're interested in checking it out. But overall, this code is relatively straightforward. It's just creating different formatters for us. So now what we can do, if we go back to that particular page, is I can actually call that format number for our case. So we'll say format number. Make sure that I import this. And this is just going to make sure it formats it with actual commas and everything inside of here. And same thing down here for our amount. I can format this as a currency. Make sure I pass that in and import this function. There we go. So now you can see it at least says dollar sign zero and it'll give us other information if it was a large number. For example, if we put in here, just a really large number, 
you can see it has commas and everything. So it looks really nice out of the box. And this is just all built into JavaScript. Now for our subtitle, to give us a little bit more context, I'm just gonna wrap this in some string templating. There we go. And I want this just to say orders, just so we know that there have been zero total orders and they have accumulated to zero total dollars. Obviously, as we make orders, we'll get more information inside of here. Now, the next thing I wanna do after that is going to be doing all of our different customers. So we'll call this customers. There we go. And what we wanna do is we want to have the average value of our customers. So we'll have here our average value, which is going to be some information that we place inside of here. And then inside of our body, I want to just have the total number of customers. So this will be format number of some particular number, and this will be a format currency of some particular currency. So let's go up and actually get our user data up here. So we can say async function get user data. The first thing I want is the total number of users. So we'll say const user count is equal to db.user.count. That'll just give me the count of the number of users. And we can just make sure that we await that. And then we can come down here and we can get our order data, which is just equal to awaiting db.orders. And this is going to be another aggregate. And in this case, we want to get the sum of the price paid in cents, essentially the same thing that we did before. And that's because I want to be able to get the average value of each individual customer. So if I have my total number of customers and the total amount that I've made, if I do the division, I can actually get the average of the amount that each customer has actually paid. Now, instead of doing these awaits back to back, this is not super performant. I'm instead going to put them inside of a promise.all. So inside this promise.all, I'm going to first call this function, and then I'm going to call this function directly afterwards. So then I can say const, I'm going to have my user count as my first value and my order data as my second value from awaiting that. There we go. Make sure I put the D right there. Clear out that. And now you can see that if I spell this properly, DB, there we go, that we are now able to do both of these at one time instead of doing them back to back. Next up, I just want to return my information. So we'll say we're going to have our user count just like that. And then we're going to have our average value per user. And this average value per user is just going to be a really simple calculation where first of all, if we have no users, well then our average value per user is going to be zero. This is just preventing any division by zero. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our order data. I'm gonna get that value for the price paid in cents. This is the total amount I've made. I'm gonna set this to zero by default. I'm gonna divide this by our user count and then divide it by hundred to make sure we convert from pennies to dollars. That's gonna give me all the different user data that I need. And I can use that down here by saying, get user data, and this is our user data. Now I wanna again, make sure I do these in parallel. So I'm gonna use a promise.all. I'm gonna wrap both of these functions in it. So pass in that function first, and then get user data second. And we'd say const sales data and user data, just like that, and remove these, make sure that we await this. And now we have our information just like we want it to. And here I can use my user data dot average value and my user data dot user count to actually get this information. So now you can see we have our customers. Each one has a dollar average of zero and we have zero total customers. Again, we'll see more information once we actually start adding more things. Now, the last thing I want is going to be my products. So we'll say products. And this should say customers instead of customer. And this products is actually going to say active products because we want to determine how many active products we have. I'm going to format a number here. And this formatted number is going to be some particular number. And this is going to be my inactive products. So we'll say inactive after this. There we go. And then down here, we're going to again format a number with something inside of it. We don't know what that will be yet, though. So we have our function for getting our user data, our sales data. Let's do one for getting our func product data. So get product data. There we go. Make sure I spell all that correctly. And inside of here, we can just say db.product to get what we need. So essentially, I just want to get the count of active and inactive products. So we can say db.count, and I want to do it where my is available for purchase is actually set to true. And then I can copy that down and do the exact same thing for where this is actually false. Now, of course, to make sure we do these in parallel, I'm going to put them inside of a promise.all, just like that. There we go. And then I can say that const, what we're going to have is my active count and my in active count is gonna be equal to awaiting that just like that. And then we can just return that. So we can return our active count and our inactive count as a func or as an object, sorry. So down here, get product data, just like that, call that function. That's going to give us our product data. And now we can use that down here. So the first thing I wanna do is my inactive numbers. 
and then we're going to put our active numbers down here. So active count, just like that. Now, if I save it, you can see we have all of our different active product information as well as our inactive product information. Now I'm just gonna fix the typo here of removing these parentheses. Obviously we don't need those. So the brackets, sorry. And then what I wanna do next is actually going to be adding in a loading state for our dashboard. And this loading state for our dashboard does not have to be complicated, good looking, or fancy because this is just a dashboard that our actual admin users are using. So when you're using admin stuff, it doesn't have to be beautiful, it just has to be functional. So we're gonna create one loading spinner that works for every single admin page we create. So we never have to worry about creating custom loading animations. So we'll say loading.txx export default function admin loading, just like that. And inside of here, all I'm going to do is return a single div. This div is going to have a class name of flex and justify in the center, just like that, so that this can be a centered loading spinner. And then we're going to use this loader to icon. This comes from Lucid React, which actually comes with Shad CN UI. So if you're using Shad CN, this is just imported already. Otherwise, you can create this own import yourself. And what we're going to do is add some class names to this. So we'll say size of 24. And we're going to animate it with this spin animation. And that's the only thing we need to do for this loading page. Like I said, it's going to be incredibly straightforward and simple. Now, if we wanted to see what this would look like, all we could do is just maybe slow down this particular database query that is happening inside of here. So I could just say like a wait for two seconds. So we'll say wait two seconds, just like that. And I'll create a really simple wait function. Function wait duration, which is a number. And it's just gonna return a new promise resolve set timeout, or we call resolve after our particular duration. So it's just gonna wait two seconds. So now if I refresh this page, you can see we get that loading spinner for two seconds before our page shows up. Super straightforward and simple. It's nothing fancy, but for an admin page, that is more than enough. Another thing that I'm gonna do automatically for our admin page, I'm gonna to go to my layout, and here I'm going to export a constant variable called dynamic, and this is gonna be set to force dynamic, just like that. And what this is going to do is it's going to force Next.js to not cache any of our admin pages. Now you could add caching to these pages to make them a little bit faster, but for admin pages, you're generally going to have relatively good internet speed wherever you're working on these admin pages. And you don't want these to always be cached because you want whatever the most up-to-date and recent information is. So we're just going to ignore all caching problems that we could ever run into by forcing every single admin page to always be dynamically generated. Now, if we did this throughout our entire application, this would be a problem because users are gonna be using our application all the time. But since the admin pages are not accessed very often, this is really not a big deal at all. Now, the next thing I wanna work on is this products page because once we have that done, we can actually go ahead and start working on the front end customer facing portion of our application. So we'll create a new folder called products. And inside of here, I'll create a page.tsx just like that. Export default function products page. We'll call this the admin product page. There we go. And inside of here, we'll just return an H1 that says hi, just so if we go to the products page, you can see it says hi right there. So at least we know that this is working. Now inside of this products page, the very first thing that I want to do inside of here is I want to add in a page header. I'm going to actually create a custom component for this page header that'll say products just like that. And this custom component is only going to be used in the admin portion of our app. So what we could do is we could create this in our components folder, but since this is only used in the admin portion of our app, I'd rather create a custom folder called understore components in here, and then this is where I'll create my page header. Now, the reason I prefix this with underscore is that's Next.js way of saying that this folder will never be used for routing, so we can put anything inside of here. It doesn't have to be routing related. And this means that this component will live in this admin folder, which makes it easier to understand where different parts of our application are. So now we can create that page header dot tsx, make sure I capitalize that, export function page header. There we go. And this page header is going to be very simple. We're going to take in some React children. So we'll just say children is a React node, just like that. And here I'm going to return simply an h1 that is going to have whatever our children is inside of it. So our text pretty much. And then we're going to add some class names to essentially make the text a little bit larger. So we'll say 4XL, and then we'll add some spacing on the bottom of it. Super straightforward. So now in this page, if I just import page header, give that a save, you can now see that it's a much larger font size and there's some space underneath of it. I'm also going to add a button for creating a new product as well. So I'm going to wrap this in a div because I want the button to be right next to the page header. So to line these up side by side, I'm going to be using some flex box. So we'll say flex justify is going to be between to space them out. 
and we're going to put items in the center, and then finally have a gap of four between these elements. Then I'm going to use a button component. Now this component comes from ShadCN, so I'm going to search for button, and we're going to just do the install process for this. Super straightforward, npx add button essentially. So we can just run that code right here. That's going to add that button component into our actual library. So if we look in here, you can now see we have that button component. You can customize it, do whatever you want. Again, in our case, we're just going to be leaving everything as the default. So now I can import that button component. And inside of here, I can put whatever my text is that I want. Now, in my case, I want this to actually be a link that goes to another page. So I'm going to put a link component inside of here, which an href that goes to slash admin slash products slash new to go to that new product form. And this will say add product. And to make my button work, I can just say as child, and that's going to make sure it renders this out as a link instead of as a button component. So now if we come over here and I give this page a quick refresh and I make sure my application is running, we should see now we have that button over on the right hand side. Now, the final thing I want to render out is a table. So we can say that we're going to have a function called products table, just like that. And inside of here, we're going to return some content inside of here, but that's going to be a table straight from Sag CN. They have a data table, which is great for doing different searching and filtering and sorting and so on. If you want to get a more complex admin page, these would be great, but a super simple table that just has no sorting or anything can also be used. So we'll copy the code to import that. And again, like I said, if you want to make it more complex, go with the data table. It's much better for a larger, more fully fledged application. But when you're just getting started, you don't need something like that. A simple table is going to be more than enough. So now we actually have that table. So I can come in here and I can make sure that I import my table, make sure I get it from that component UI folder like that. And then inside of here, I can also say that I want to have my table header. So we'll say table header, just like that. And inside the table header, I'm going to have a row. So we'll say table row. And inside of that, I'm going to have some individual table head elements. So we'll say table head, just like that. And these are going to be our actual headline sections for our table. Now we're going to have just a few of these. So I'm going to have name, copy this down a couple of times. We're going to have price and we're going to have orders to determine the actual number of orders that we've had. And then we're going to have two unique ones. These are actually aren't really going to have any text inside of them. And they're actually going to be super small. We're going to set the width on these to be zero. That's going to make them essentially as small as humanly possible. It won't actually be a width of zero. It'll just be as small as it can possibly be. Now, what I want to do inside of here, I'm going to put a span and that span is going to have a class name of SR only. This is going to be screen reader only. So that way the screen reader knows what this section of the table is for. And this will be labeled as available for purchase. And that's because we're going to essentially have a check mark or an X in this column to determine if this is available for purchase or not. And if you can visually see the page, it's really easy to understand what's going on. We don't need an actual headline for that. But if you're unable to see the page, having a headline is really useful. Same thing here for this section. I'm going to essentially copy exactly what I had here. And this one is going to be called actions instead. And this is because I'm going to have a really small little icon on the right hand side that I can click on to open up a drop down menu of all the different things I can do like edit, delete, deactivate, and so on. So if I give this a quick save and I make sure up here I actually render out my products table, give that a quick save, give that a refresh over here. We should at least see that we have those headers showing up. As you can see, we have the header section showing up on our page, but obviously we don't really have any content inside of here yet. What we could do is we could add in our table body just like this. And inside of here, we would loop through all of our different products and render out some different rows. But for now, we don't have any products. So let's just go ahead and focus on how to create a new product before we worry about how to render it inside this table. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to create a brand new folder called new. And inside of here, I'll create our page.tsx export default function. This is our new product page. And this is going to be very simple. We're going to return essentially two things. The first one is going to be our page header. And that page header is going to say add a product, just like that. And then after that, we're going to render out our form. So we'll say product form, just like that. Make sure that I close all this off properly. There we go. So now if I give that a quick save, you can see we have those two things being rendered. So let's actually create the component for our product form. Now I could create that in this components folder here, but since this is only for our products, I might as well just create a folder here called components and do it inside of here. So we'll say product form.tsx export function product form just like that. Now this is going to be a client component. So I'm going to come up here and say use client just so we know that this is a client component. And we're going to be needing to use labels and inputs as well as text areas. And ShadCN has all of those. So you can see here, if we search for a label, we have the ability to import a label. So I'm going to come in here, 
we're gonna add a label. I'm gonna do the exact same thing for inputs. So once this finishes installing, I'll do the same thing for an input component, and I'm gonna do the exact same thing for a text area. So we'll have text area, just like that. That way we have all the different components that we could possibly need. And if we look inside of here, you can see we have all those new components being added, which will make working with our forms much easier. Now, Shad CN has a full form component that you can use, and it has like Zod, and it has React hook form all hooked up for you. But since our forms are going to be really, really straightforward, and we have almost no forms in our application, we don't really need that super complex form integrations. We can just do everything on our own. So for our return here, we're going to return essentially a form. And just to make sure that everything's working on this page, I'll import our product form just like that. And we'll go to that add product page make sure that I have our application started back up, npm run dev, there we go. So now if we give this a quick refresh, it should bring us to that page, it should say add product, and then nothing because our form is currently completely blank. So inside of our form, we wanna create a div, and this div is gonna wrap our label. So we're gonna have a label, make sure we get that from the correct import, and we're also going to have an input. And again, make sure you get that from the correct import, just like that. So the very first thing that we need is gonna be our name. So the type for this is gonna be text, we're gonna have an ID, which is gonna be name. We're gonna have a name on this, which is going to be name. It's going to be required just like that. Our label will say name and our HTML4 is going to be name. So the reason we have an ID of name is so we can hook that up to our HTML4. And the reason we give it a name is because that is the actual key that we use inside of our action that we're gonna set up later to actually get the value from our form. Now, the final thing I'm gonna do is add some spacing. So we'll say our class name here, space in the Y direction is gonna be two. And here our space in the Y direction is going to be eight actually. So now you can see we have our name input where we can pass in our name information. Now I'm just essentially gonna copy this down because we're gonna do the exact same thing, but this is gonna be our price in cents, just like that. Our ID here is price in cents. We're gonna do the exact same thing for our name and make sure our HTML4 is set correctly. This is gonna be a number input just like that. And for this one, I'm actually gonna go a step further. And that's because I'm gonna add in a value prop, which is gonna be our price in cents and an on change prop. So I can actually get the value of this dynamically. So we'll say on change E and we can say set price in cents to E.target.value. So we can just create some state for this const price in cents set price in sense is equal to use state. There we go. And this by default is going to be zero. And actually, instead of giving that a default value, which is coming here, specify this as a number input. So by default is going to be a completely blank input. Now down here, since our value is technically a string, we need to convert this to a number. So we'll say number or undefined. So essentially, if this is not able to be converted to a number, it'll just give us undefined instead. So now whatever we type inside of here is our price in cents. Now, the reason I st stored this in state is because down here, I'm going to have a div with a class name of text muted foreground. There we go. And this text muted foreground is going to show the actual dollar amount version. So what I can do is I can say format currency, currency, there we go. And inside this format currency, I want to get my price in cents, divide it by 100, and then I want to render that out to the screen. So now you can see right now it's showing NAN. But if I just defaulted this to zero, if, for example, it was not a number, you can now see it's saying zero, which is exactly what I want. And if I come in here and say that it's 100 pennies, you can now see it says one dollar or it says ten dollars and two cents and so on. So it's a really easy way to see what the dollar amount is. Now I'm going to copy down this up here. And I'm going to paste that down so we get another input going. And this one is going to be for our description. There we go, description. And the name here is going to be description, just like that. There we go. Description, and this one is going to be a text area. So make sure we import text area. We don't need to specify a type on that. Now you can see we get the ID name and required property, and you can see our description is showing up right here. Now I'm gonna do another copy down up here, paste this down, and this one is going to be for our file, and this is the actual file we download. So we'll just call this file. This one will say file and make sure the type is file, the ID is file, and the name is file. And now you can see we have this file chooser right here. I'm gonna copy this down one more time because we also want to be able to select our image. So this one is going to be called image instead of file. Same thing with the ID and the name. And this will say image just like that. So now we have our image selector down here as well. And just to show you that there's nothing behind my camera, you can see I can just move it. It's essentially just these inputs. So there's really nothing that I'm hiding behind my camera. Now the very last thing that we need is a submit button. So I can come in here with a button just like that. I can specify that this is going to say save and the type is going to be submit. 
and let's just make sure that we import this button component. There we go. So now I have that save button showing up down here. Now, in order to actually make this form work, we need to specify an action on our form. And this is going to be using a server action. And the easiest way to do this is just to create some actions for our products. So we're going to do this directly in the products folder. We're going to create an underscore actions. And actually, instead of doing that in the products folder, I'm just going to do it in the admin folder. So this is going to be for all of our different admin actions. I'm going to create a folder or a file here called products.ts. This is going to be for our actions for our product. So I can create a function called add product, make sure I export this. And now if I make sure that this is an async function, since actions must be async, I now have a function that I can call from my client onto my server. And to make sure that this runs on the server, I can just specify up here, use server just like that. So now this add product function is going to run on the server, and it's going to take in form data which is of the form data object. And this is coming directly from the information in my form. I can even just do a quick console.log of form data so we can see exactly what's being pushed up. Now to make this work, we're gonna to go to our product form and we're gonna add in that action of add product just like that. You can see we have no errors. And if we give this a quick save and I open up my console, let's type in something for our name. So this will say test price, we'll just make it $1. So we'll come in here just like that. Description will say body and we can choose some files. So I'm gonna say that this file right here is going to be some just SRT file, and then we're gonna use an image right here. And now if I click on save, you can see inside of my console, it prints out all the information to us. So if we just open this up, you can see we have our form data. Our name is name with a value of test. Our name here, price and cents, value of 100, description is body, and both of our files are being passed up as well. So it's super easy to pass up all the information we need inside this form data object. Now to do validation though is a little bit more complex. So that's where I'm going to be using Zod for all of our validation needs. So to import Zod, we can just close out of this NPM I Zod, just like that. This is a really great validation library. If you want to learn more about it, I have a full video on it. I'll link in the cards and description for you and you can check it out. It goes super in depth in everything you need to know about Zod. But with Zod, the main thing is you want to be able to create a schema based on an object. So we'll say Z, which is what Zod is being imported as. And we'll say object and this object is going to represent what the data we're going to be passing up is so in our case we're going to have a name and this is going to be a string so we'll say z.string and the minimum length is one essentially we're making sure it is required we're going to do the exact same thing with our description so our description this one is a z.string just like that and the minimum length again is one make sure i spell that properly then we're going to come down here. We're going to have our price in cents. This one is going to be a number and we want to coerce it into a number. So we're going to say z.coerce.number. And that's because our form data is using string values. So if we look up here, you can see that this value is a string of 100. So coerce attempts to convert it into a number first. And if it can't, it's going to throw an error. We also want to make sure that this is an integer and that the minimum value must be at least one because our products cannot be free for this particular way that I'm doing things. Now, the final things we have are our file as well as our image. And these ones are a little bit interesting because the way that they work is a little different because there's no really handy like dot file that we can use. So we're going to create our own file schema. So we'll say const file schema is equal to z dot instance of file. So we're saying that this object must be an instance of the file object inside of this. And if we look up here, you can see both of these of are the instance of file, which is exactly what we want. So we're saying it must be a file. And if it's not, we're gonna pass along a message that just says required, just like that. So now we can say our file schema, just like that. And what we can also do is take this a step further because when we add a product, we must make sure that this file has a size. And that's because if you don't put a file into your file input and you submit your form, it'll actually submit a file to your server, but it'll be a completely empty file with a size of zero. So to test for this, we can use refine. This will take in our file object and we can say that the file.size must be greater than zero. And if it's not, we can say that it is going to be required. I can do the exact same thing for my image as well down here by saying my file size must be greater than zero and that it is required if we don't have that. Now I'm gonna take this an even step further though by creating an image schema. And this is just going to refine my image even further. So this is gonna be based on a file schema, but I'm gonna refine this just one step further by saying that my file size, file.size, whoops, it's gonna first take a file. And it's gonna say if my file size is equal to zero, or if my file dot type dot starts with, and it's going to be image slash, just like that. And now I can use this image schema down here as well. So this may look a little bit confusing. So let me explain exactly what's happening. This image schema, the reason I'm saying file dot size is equal to zero or this particular check is if my file size is zero, that means I did not submit a file at all. So I'm just going to essentially ignore this check completely. So if I didn't submit a file, just don't do this check. 
But if I did submit a file, check to make sure the type of that file is of some form of image, whether it's PNG, JPEG, it doesn't matter. The type will start with image slash if it is an image specific file. Now, the reason I'm doing my size checks down here instead of doing them up here is because when I add a brand new form or a brand new product, my image and my file are required. But when I edit a product, I don't need to specify a new file or a new image. So when I do my editing, these will actually be optional fields, which is why the actual section that checks the size is only inside the schema for adding. And we can call this our add schema just like that. So now we can use that add schema with our form data to verify that our data is in the correct format and it'll convert everything to the correct type strip types for us as well. So what we can do is we can say object.fromEntries and we'll take our form data.entries. What that'll do is convert our form data to an actual object that we can use. Then I can take my add schema and what I can do is I can safely parse this information. And what this will do is return to me some data. So we could say const result is equal to that. And if I look at this result object, you'll notice that I have a success property of true or false. And if it's true, I'll have data. And if it's false, I'll have an error. So if my result.success is equal to false, then what I can do is return the errors down to user. So I'll say result.error.formerrors, and I'll get the errors for each individual field. This is essentially going to give me a bunch of different properties for my name, description, price and sense, file, image, and so on. So it's just gonna give me essentially error messages for all of these. Then what I can do is if it was successful, I can come down here, I can create a data property, which is just result.data. And this is all of the data I have up here. If I look at the type, you can see we have a name, string, description, string, price and sense number, and both of our different files. And we can use that information to create a brand new product for us. If I say db, this is coming from our database, dot product, and we wanna create a brand new product where we have some specific data that we're gonna be passing in. So inside of here, you can see we have all of our different properties. So our name is data.name. We're going to have our description, which is data.description. And inside of here, our price and sense is data.price and sense. Now our file path that we have here, as well as our image path, these are going to be a little bit more complicated. And that's just because we need to first save our file to our file system before we can actually save the path to them inside of our database. So to do that, I'm gonna be using the FS module inside of Node.js. So I can say import FS from, and this is gonna be coming from FS slash promises. I want to use the specific promise version because it's much easier to work with in modern JavaScript. So I can say FS dot mkdir, which is going to make a directory, and we want to create a directory called products. That's going to be where we store all of our different product files that they can download. And we're going to make sure that we call this recursive of true, just to make sure if we have multiple files we want to create, it'll create them recursively, which is great. So then we can come in here, we can say we're going to await doing that. Then the next thing that we can do is determine what our file path is going to be. So we'll say file path is equal to, and this is going to be inside that products folder that we just created. And then I'm just going to essentially create a brand new random ID. So we're going to say crypto dot random UUID. So it's just going to create a random ID. And then I'm going to append onto the end of that my file name, just so I have a random ID to make sure there's never any conflicting files. And then I'm going to put in what the file is actually called. Then what we can do is we can actually add this file to our actual file path. So right now we've created the path we want to save it to. Next, we can actually save that file. So I can say fs dot write file, just like that, we can pass it in the path we want to create. And then we need to pass in our file. Now to do this is a little bit complicated. All we do is just say buffer dot from whoops dot from and then we need to get our file. So we can say data dot file dot array buffer. And if we await this, what it's going to do is it's going to convert our file into a buffer. And then we can pass that buffer along to write file. Essentially, we're just taking our file from whatever format it's currently in and converting it to a file that our actual node.js knows how to use to write a file. So this is actually written the file we can download. And then we can essentially just copy this code and do the exact same thing, but for our image as well. Now for our image, we want to store this inside the public folder so it's easily accessible inside of our application. So it's gonna be inside a public slash products. That's the folder that we want to create. Now for our image path here, we can just say image path, just like that. That is going to be inside of the products folder as well. And the reason we don't put public in front of this is because we don't actually need to specify the public folder. The public folder is just any file that is publicly available on our site. So we don't need to put public in front of that because when we use this URL to render our image, it'll already assume it's inside of that public folder. Then what we can do is make sure that this is using the image name right here. And this is using the image that we want to create. 
and this is using the image path right here. So now we're saving the image to that particular path. And again, I wanna make sure I prefix this image path with public so it's being stored in the right place. So we'll say public, and then we'll put in our image path. And my image path already starts with a slash, which is why there's no slash in between these two. Now for our data, we have our file path and our image path just like that. So that should be all the data we need to actually create our project. So, or our product, sorry. So we can just await creating that product. And now our product has been created. And what we can do is we can redirect the user to the admin page. So we can slash slash admin slash products, just like that. And we wanna make sure that we import this redirect from Next.js. So there we go. It looks like it imported the wrong one. So let me make sure I remove that and actually import the correct redirect function, which is from Next Navigate. There we go, that's all that we need to do. So if there's some type of error, it'll give us back an error which we can render on our page. And if not, it'll redirect us to the admin's product page. So let's create a test two. We'll make this one a little bit more expensive and we'll say body two. And we'll even change the files here to be this number two file. And this one will be the number two image. Now, when I click save, you can see it's creating that project and it should hopefully redirect me to the products page. And as you can see, it has. Now there's lots of stuff we can add to this to make it better, such as error states and loading. So let's do that now before we focus on this table. So if we go over to our product form, the very first thing we can do is add in the loading state. That's super easy to do. What we wanna do is we wanna take our button and we're gonna move it into its own component. So we'll say function submit button, just like that. And we're essentially just gonna copy this button down exactly as it is. The reason we brought this into its own component though is because we can use the form status hook just like this. And this is going to give us our pending state. There we go. And now we can use that pending state to disable our button. So we can say disabled is going to be pending. So now if our form is currently in the process of submitting, it's going to be disabled. We can even change our text here. So if we're in the pending state, it'll be saying saving. Otherwise it'll say save just like that. And now we can render that submit button up here, close out of all of this right there. And now if we go to the add product, and we were to try to submit our form, it's actually going to submit our form and show that loading spinner down here for us. So what we can do, specify a name, specify a price and cents, specify a description. Now when I click on save, make sure that we actually specify these properties. For now, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to, I will, for now we'll just pass a negative here. And then we can actually create our images and stuff that we want. And now when I click on save, you're gonna notice it doesn't actually save anything or do anything. Now it is technically making a request, but it's so fast, we're not actually seeing it happen. So I'm gonna bring over our actual development tools. We're gonna to go to our network. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna throttle this to be fast 3G. So it'll hopefully slow this down a little bit. So now when I click on save, you can see it's making that request, but it looks like it's still not actually setting the pending status for our button, which is obviously not quite what we want. So we wanna make sure that we fix that. So let's get rid of all this throttling. We also don't have any error messages showing up. So we wanna make sure we fix that as well. So let's go ahead and fix the error messages and doing so may actually just fix our button as well. So up here, we're gonna to need to import a brand new hook. This one's called use form state, just like that, use form state. And this is actually taking in the action that we want. So this is our add product action. And it takes in whatever our default value is going to be, which in our case is going to be an empty object. And it's going to return to us an error, which in our case is whatever we return from our action. So here in our action, the only thing we ever return is an error, which is why it's returning to us an error. And then it's also going to return to us an action we can use. So we're going to call this action. So now we just set the action here and that's going to work for our action. But the one thing is you'll notice we get an error and that's because whenever you use this hook, you need to make sure your action actually has two properties, the previous state, as well as whatever your current state is. Now, since we're not using this current state or the previous state, I'm just going to set this to unknown because we really don't care what that is. But now you'll notice if I save this, we now have this error object that we can use. So for each one of our inputs, if we have an error, I want to display it. So if our name property has an error, well then what I wanna do is I wanna display a div. The class name is gonna be text destructive. That'll give us a red text. And inside of here, I'll just put whatever error I have for my name property. And we'll just close off that div. There we go. I'm gonna copy this down, do the exact same thing here, but instead of name, this will say price in cents. Same thing here, price in cents. I'll now copy this down another time and put it into here, but this one is going to be for our description. I'm gonna be copying this down again here, but this is for our file. And then finally, right here, this is going to be for our image. There we go. So now we have errors being shown up. So now if I click save, we are getting an error. That's just because we need to make sure we refresh our page before we actually try this. So here, I'm gonna say test three. Price and cents is gonna be negative, so that should hopefully give us an error. Here's a random description. 
It doesn't really matter what we submit for these particular sections here. But now when I save, you can see number must be greater than or equal to one. So our errors are being passed down to us. And you'll notice my save right here is actually flashing to that pending state. And if we were to fix this by making this an actual price and I click save, you'll notice it says saving, it was gray, and then we got redirected to products. Now, if I slowed down my page, you would have noticed that saving text would have shown for longer, but at least we could see that it was working. Now, one final thing we should probably do with new products is we should probably make it so that they is available for purchase is set to false by default, just so we know that anytime we create a new product, it's always going to be not available for purchase. So now let's go ahead and actually render out the rows inside of our table, because now we have like two or three different products inside of our table that we can render out. So inside of our page for that, let's just go to that page. There we go. Now we have our page opened up. Inside of our table body, I want to render out every single row that we need. So we can see here that we have our available for purchase, name, price, orders, as well as all the different actions associated with that. So first we need to actually get our products. So we'll say products is equal to awaiting and we want to search our products in our database. So we'll say db.products. We want to find many so that's going to be finding essentially all of our different products and we'll make sure that this is async now i also only want to select certain fields so inside of here i'm going to specify all the fields i want for example i want to get my id i want to get my name i want to get the price in cents i want to get is it available for purchase i need all of that i also want to get the file path so that i can download that if i want to and actually, I don't believe I need the file path based on the way that we did downloads. And then finally, I want to get the number of orders for this. So I'm going to select my orders, true. So I'm just going to get the count of the number of orders that I have as well. And then finally, I'm going to do a simple order by on the name ascending. So at least we can get them in name based order. So now we have all of our products and we can do whatever we want. First of all, if our products dot length is equal to zero, we should probably just say something like no products found doesn't matter what it is you can make it more beautiful than that but for now that's going to be perfectly fine obviously we have products though so if we refresh our page you'll notice this does not show up now inside of our body here though we can loop through each one of our products so for each one of our products product there we go what i want to do is i want to render out a table row and inside this table row i'm going to have a table cell for each of the different things we need so cell just like that and the first table cell is going to be whether or not the product is available for purchase or not. Also, I want to make sure that I have a key on here. So we'll say product.id, just like that. So now inside of this table cell, what I can do is I can say product.is available for purchase. If it is available for purchase, I want to show a check mark. So I can come in here and I can get the check mark icon, which is check circle, and that's going to be number two. That's the one we're going to be using. That's going to show that icon for us. And then what we can do, make sure we close all this off, because if it is not available for purchase, then we want to show the X circle icon. So we'll make sure that we import that icon just like that. And again, I'm going to put this inside of fragments because I'm going to add a screen reader only version as well. So now you can see that those check marks are showing up because these two products are available for purchase. That's just because we didn't make the change to our action until after we created these products. So now what I can do is I can add my screen reader only section. So I can say span class name is going to be screen reader only and this is just going to say available just like that and i'm going to paste this down and this is just going to say unavailable there we go so now at least the screen reader will know what these check mark icons actually mean so there's our very first cell our next cell is going to be much more simple because it's just going to be our product dot name just like that so now you can see our name is showing up we'll copy this down again and this one is going to be for our price so we'll say format currency this is going to be our product dot price in cents divided by 100. There we go. Now we'll copy this down again. This is because we want to figure out how many orders we have. So we're going to format a number. And this is just our product dot count dot orders. We'll clear that out, give that a save. And you can see both of them have zero orders. And then for our final table cell, what we want to do is we want to essentially have that triple dot icon. So what we can do is we can call this more vertical. That's the name of the icon that we're going to use, just like that. Give that a quick save. You can see that that gives us the icon over here. And we're also going to add a screen reader only span as well. So span, class name, screen reader only. That's going to say actions, just so that screen readers know what this is going to mean. And this is actually going to be all inside of a drop down menu, which again comes directly from Shad Sien. So we can search for a drop down menu, and I can scroll down, and you can see the install for this is incredibly simple. So we'll just come over here paste that down, and it's going to actually install this drop-down menu for us, and then we can rerun our application once this is finished. So give that a quick rerun, there we go. 
And now you can see that we'll have this drop down menu component. So to use this, we can come in here, say drop down menu, make sure we import the correct one, put all of our content inside of there. Then we're going to have our drop down menu trigger. And again, make sure we import the correct one. And this is essentially the button that we click. So this means that this is the button to open our drop down. So if we come over here, that is going to be our button. So if we give this a quick refresh, make sure everything reloads on our page. Because now see when I hover over this, I essentially get the ability to click on this drop down. Now the next step is to determine what the content for our drop down menu is going to be. So we can have our drop down menu content just like that. Again, make sure we import the correct one. And inside of here, we have individual drop down menu items. So we can get for each one of our items, we can render them out. Now our items are mostly going to be links or buttons. So in our case, we're going to be using a link for this first one, because this first one is going to be for downloading our actual file. But this is going to be a different link than you're used to, because instead of using a Next.js link like this, we're actually just going to use a basic anchor tag. And that's because when we download something, we want to send it off to essentially an API route that's going to be just downloading a specific file. It's much different than routing to a particular page. That's why we're using a normal anchor tag. And we're even going to say that this is going to be a download anchor tag. And then for the href, we're just going to add in here a link that goes to slash admin slash products slash whatever our product ID is. So we'll say product.id slash download, just like that. So we can actually download that specific ID. There we go. And this will say download. Give that a quick save. Now, if I open that up, you can see I have that download option right there. Now, obviously we want more items and this one should say as child, just so it's actually going to show up as that particular link, just like that. Now I'm just gonna copy this drop down menu item because it's gonna be very similar for this one. But in this case, we're gonna be using a link instead. And that's because this is going to be linking to our edit page. So let's making sure that we get this from React or from Next.js, so there we go. And we're gonna close that off. It's gonna have an href and this href is going to go to the slash admin slash products slash, and this is gonna be our product.id slash edit. There we go. And this will say edit. So now we have a link going to that edit page. Open this up. You can now see we have both of those different options. And then we need to have options that are going to be for deactivating slash activating as well as for deleting our particular product as well. Now, both of these buttons are actually going to need to have client interaction. And since this is a server component, we cannot do that inside this file. So I need to create a brand new full component for that. So inside of here, I'll create a product actions.ts x. There we go. And inside of here, I can export my function, for example, the active toggle drop down item. There we go. And I'm also going to have one for the export function delete drop down item. So these are my different drop down items for active toggling as well as deleting. And these are going to be relatively straightforward. I'm going to return a drop down menu item. There we go. And for this drop down menu item, I first need to get some props. I'm going to have my ID as well as my is available for purchase. And this is going to be an ID, which is a string and is available for purchase is a Boolean, just so we can determine what the actual properties of this are. So the ID of my product and if it's currently available for purchase. Now, what I wanna do is set up an on click. This is the important part. So in our on click, we're gonna come in here. This is gonna be a function. And inside of this function, all we're gonna do is call start transition. And start transition is going to be coming from a hook called use transition. So we can say const is pending and start transition are coming from the use transition hook, just like that. Make sure I don't import start transition up here since we don't actually need it. And now we can start an asynchronous function, which is going to do the toggling of our actual active state. So what I can do is I can say await, I wanna to toggle my product availability, just like that, my ID, and I'm gonna essentially do the opposite of if it is available for purchase. And this is going to be an action that we're going to create. So inside of here, I'm going to essentially export an async function with that exact name, just like that. And it's going to be taking in an ID, which is a string. And it's going to be saying is available for purchase, which is a Boolean. And all we want to do is just update our product. So inside of here, we're just going to do a quick await db.product.update. We're going to do a where my ID is my ID. And then for the data, 
we're just gonna be setting is available for purchase to be whatever my is available for purchase is. So it's just taking this information and updating my product accordingly. And that's all we need to do. We can also return the product if we really want to, but it really doesn't matter. This is pretty much all that we need to do to actually make this work. So now inside of here, I can make sure that I import this particular function I just created. So now I'll give that a quick save. I'll come into here and I'll say that if it is available for purchase, then what I wanna do is call this deactivate. Otherwise, I wanna call it activate, just like that. There we go. And then we can use this is pending state to disable this. So we'll say disabled if we are currently in the pending state. Now I'm gonna do almost the exact same thing for my delete dropdown button. So I'm gonna copy all this code down into here. This is gonna take in some properties, which are going to be ID as well as disabled, just like that. And that's going to be an ID, which is a string and we're gonna have disabled, which is a Boolean. There we go. Now, like I said, this is gonna be working very similar. Our disabled is going to be disabled either if this prop is passed in as true or if we are currently in the pending state. And this is going to be called delete product. Now, the reason I'm passing in my disabled state right here is because I wanna make sure that if I already have orders for that product, I cannot delete it. So if I have orders, this disabled is gonna be true because I can never delete something if it has orders. So now we can create this delete product function and that's going to be inside of our actions section. So let's come over here, go to our products actions, export async function delete product, which takes in the ID of the product we wanna delete. And we'll say db.product.delete where ID. There we go. We're just going to delete that product, await that, and that should be all we need to do. The only thing I would like to do, though, is first get my product, just like that. And if we don't have a product, so if my product is equal to null, then I'll return not found, just so we know that, hey, we could not find this particular product when we tried to delete it. There we go. So now if I go to my actions and I import this particular function, that should be my actions completely done. And now if I give that a save and we go back over to my page here, all the way down to the very bottom, we can actually add those actions in. So we can say that this is going to be my add, I'm sorry, not add, it is going to be my toggle, active toggle dropdown item, and we're gonna want one for delete as well. And for each one of these, I just need to pass along the props. So this is gonna be my product.id, and my is available for purchase is my product.is available for purchase. And for this, we're gonna have our ID, which is product.id, and the disabled prop is going to be set to my product dot, and I wanna just make sure that my count for my orders is greater than zero. So if I have any orders at all, this will be a disabled prop. Now we are getting an error, and that's just because I need to make sure that I specify that this is a client page. So we can say use client, just like that. That should fix those problems. And now you can see we have my deactivate and my delete button showing up. Now, one thing that I would like to do is just make this look a little bit better. So I'm gonna add in here a drop down menu separator. There we go. This is just gonna add a nice little line between these two, so it's a little bit easier to distinguish between them. And I'm also going to make this delete one actually have a red text instead of this normal black text. So what we can do is we can go into our component UI. I wanna search for the dropdown menu, and here I'm searching for the dropdown menu item. Now I wanna make this dropdown menu item very similar to how the button is. As you can see, they're using class variance authority for this, which is a really great library. I'm actually gonna copy over the code for this, so you don't have to watch me type it all out. But essentially the only thing that I'm doing is adding these three classes right here. I'm adding a brand new variant called destructive. And you can see here, I'm adding just this background color destructive. Essentially, I'm just making it so that it has a reddish color in the case that I pass on this variant of destructive. And then I'm gonna be making sure I add a new prop for that as well. So I'm gonna say my variant here is going to be either default or destructive, since that's what I called it. And down here where I have my classes being created, all I'm gonna be doing is taking this drop-down menu item variance, which comes from that CVA function. I'm gonna be passing that all into here. So I'm gonna get rid of all these default classes that are there, paste that just like that. I'm gonna be passing in my variant and I'm gonna be passing in my class name as well. And we can remove the class name from down here. And if I make sure that I get my variant from up here, now you can see that I have my variant passed in. So now my product uh, component that I created for my actions, I can come down here and I can specify destructive I'm sorry, variant, 
is equal to destructive, just like that. So now if I open this up, you can see it has this red text and this red background, which makes it a little bit more clear that this is a really bad thing I shouldn't click on unless I really want to. Now let's go ahead and test to make sure that these actually work. What I could do is I could come in here and I click on deactivate, and you'll notice it looks like nothing works, but if I refresh my page, you'll notice it's actually set as deactivated. Now there's a few ways we could fix this, but by far the easiest for us is just going to be going to that exact page and making sure that whenever we click on that toggle, that we actually refresh our router. So inside of here, we can actually get our router. We can say const router equals use router. Make sure I get that from the correct import, which is next navigation. And then down here, I could say router.refresh. So that's just going to refresh my page after my product is deleted or up here in the case where I'm starting that transition. After I finish the pending state change, it's going to refresh my router. So now I can come in here, refresh my page to make sure everything's working. And now if I click activate, you can see it actually toggles between those two different states. To make it a little bit more clear what the state is, I'm gonna change this to a red color instead. So on this particular page, we'll scroll up until we find the actual section here. And we're gonna come down to the one for unavailable, add a class name, and this is going to be stroke destructive. And we want this to be just like that. So now you can see it's giving me that red color when it's deactivated, and it's going to give me that perfect check mark when it's active. Now also, let's just see if our delete works. If I click delete, you can see it's been completely removed. When I refresh, it's no longer there, and that's exactly what we want. And now if I finally delete this very last one, you'll see we get that no products found message. Now, one thing that we probably should do that we're not is deleting the old products and the images for those products that we no longer need. So instead of our actions, when we go down to this delete, if we were able to successfully delete a product, then what we want to do is we want to take the product and also unlink those files. So we can say fs.unlink, and we're gonna pass in our product.file path. Make sure that I await this. This is going to completely delete that particular file. I'm gonna do the exact same thing for our image path. And we just need to make sure that we add in slash or product, not pop product, public to the front of that. So we can say public just like that. There we go. And that'll also delete our image as well. So now we'll give that a quick save. I'll delete the current files that we have inside of here. And same thing inside of here. I'll delete these files. And also I'll make sure that in my git ignore that I have those folders listed. So we can say products just like that. And we're going to have public slash products. That way this products folders as well as this public products folder no longer get uploaded to my git repository because they're purely for testing purposes. So now let's add in a brand new product. This one is going to be first product price here. Let's just make it $100. This is a product. Let's choose a file. We're just going to choose this SRT file. And for the image, we'll choose this number two image. Now, if we save, you can see we have our first project. It's currently not active. Let's just activate it for now. And you can see that it is currently active. And if I delete this, we should notice on the left-hand side, the products completely disappear. So click delete. And you'll notice that both the files for that product were deleted. Now let's go ahead and recreate that first product so we have something to work with. We'll again give it a price of 100. I don't really care what the description is, it doesn't matter. We'll come in here, we'll create those files right there. Now give that a save and we'll activate our product so it's actually available on the home page. So now let's go ahead and actually finish everything related to the admin portion of our product because we really don't have much. All we have to do is worry about editing and this download button and both of these are so much easier than anything else we've done so far. We're honestly on the home stretch for all the admin related stuff. So let's come over here. We're gonna to go to our products. We're gonna create a brand new folder called ID. This is going to be a dynamic ID page. And then inside of here, we're gonna create a brand new file as well. This is gonna be inside a download slash, and this one's gonna be route.ts. And that's because we're gonna be using an API route for our downloading. And I'm also gonna create a new folder called edit, where I'm gonna put a page for editing, page.tsx inside of here. Now my edit page pretty much looks identical to my new page. So I'm just gonna copy this over. This is gonna say edit product instead. This will be my edit product page and make sure that I get my imports correct. There we go. And same thing up here, get my imports in there correctly. Now my edit product page is actually going to also take in the product information. And that's because we have this dynamic parameter. So I'm gonna take in my params, which is an ID just like that. And I can also type this params, which is an ID, which is a string just like that. So now that I have my ID, I can actually get my product. Const product equals await db dot db dot product dot find unique and i want to get where my id is my id there we go make this an async function and now we're actually getting our product and we can pass that down to our form just like that so now if we have a product we can pass that down to our form and we can use that inside of here so we'll say that our product is going to be a type here of product 
which is going to be optional, and that's going to be of the type product, which comes directly from Prisma. So at least we know that this is of that product type. Now, if we make sure that we give everything a quick save over here, you notice we're technically getting an error. That's because product is either going to be product or null. And right now we're not accounting for null inside of this. So we just wanna make sure that this could also be null. There we go. That should get rid of all of our errors. We come over here, you can see our error has been removed. And now we have access to our product so we can use that for all of our default values. So here, this can be our product dot and we want to get that price in cents. So we're gonna default that value to our price in cents. And here we're gonna make sure that this can also be undefined as one of the particular values. Now for our inputs, we just wanna make sure that we have a default value. So here the default value is going to be product dot name or an empty string, just like that. And essentially I'm just gonna copy this down to everywhere in our application. So down here, we don't have to worry about it on this one, but for our text area, I'm gonna essentially do the exact same thing, default, value is going to be product dot, and this one is going to be for our description. There we go, copy this. And that's actually the last place I need to use that because down here, we can't actually have a default value for our input for files. We can't have a default file just because you don't have access to the file system in the browser. What we can do though is change the required property. This should only be required if our product is null because when we edit something, we do not want to force them to actually pass in a image or a file because it'll just use the image or file that already exists. So now if we go to that edit page, we should hopefully see our form and you can see it's been pre-populated with all of our information. So what I wanna do is I wanna add essentially just a little bit of information if we have a product for our file and our image, I just wanna show you what that name is. So here, if our product is not equal to null, well, then all I can do is just render out a simple div, which has a class name of text muted foreground. And I just want to render out my product dot file path, just like that. And we'll close off that div, give that a save. And now you can see down here, if I just make sure my camera is not in the way that you can see that we have that product file path showing up right there. I essentially want to do the exact same thing with an image as well. So we'll come down here to where our images. If our product is not equal to null, and then what I wanna do is I wanna render out an image tag that has that particular image. So we can get that image tag from Next.js. Our source is going to be product, whoops, product.imagePath, just like that. And then we can just specify like the height for this is going to be 400 or something like that. So let's just close that off. And we'll say with this 400, it really doesn't matter what the actual sizing is gonna be. And then we'll say our alt is going to be product image, just like that. So now if I give that a refresh, you can see this image is showing up down here. And again, if I move my camera, it just shows us a placeholder for what that image would look like. That's a really great way for us to see what we currently have uploaded. Now, the last thing to do is to actually make it so that this works when we upload something. So we need to create an action for that. So we'll go over to our products. We can minimize these actions because we don't really need to worry about them right now. All we focused on is this actual action for add. So I'm gonna copy this add action. And instead we're gonna call this update. Now this update product is gonna be almost the same, but we're gonna have an ID that we pass in here, which is going to be a string. There we go. Just so we know what we're actually currently up, uploading or updating, sorry. Then we're also going to have a schema for this. So we'll say const edit schema. And this edit schema is just going to be the same as my add schema, but I wanna extend it by changing my file to be just my default file schema. And I wanna make it optional. And I wanna do the exact same thing for my image. So we'll say that my image is the image schema and it is going to be optional as well. Now inside of our code, we can use our edit schema to parse the information that we're getting. And again, if we have a false case here, then of course we're just going to return our errors. Then if we get our data, I also want to get our product. So we'll say const product is equal to db dot product dot, and I want to find unique based on the ID that we have. So that'll be where our ID is equal to our ID. And we can just await that like that. And then if our product is equal to null, we'll just return not found since we were unable to find this particular product. Then what we can do is we can update our product based on all of our information, but we only want to update the file path and the image path if they actually changed. So what I can do here is I can say if product dot, or I'm sorry, data dot file path or data dot file, if we have a particular file, so if that's not equal to null, and if our data.file.size here is greater than zero, that means that we uploaded a file. So what I wanna do is delete the old file and create a brand new file. So what I can do here is I can just say that I wanna first unlink the original file. So await fs.product, I'm sorry, unlink 
product.filepath, just like that. Remove the existing file, then create a path to a new file and save that file. And I wanna store this in a variable. So we'll say let file path equal, and by default, it's gonna be equal to our product file path. Otherwise, if we create a brand new file, I wanna overwrite that file path. So essentially what this code is doing is if we pass up a file, delete the old file, save the new file, and save the file path to the new file, otherwise just keep our old file path. Now I'm gonna do essentially the exact same thing for our image as well. So this will be image path, and this is gonna be my product image path. And if our image size and image are not equal to null, then we're going to come in here and we're gonna unlink our image and so on. So to unlink our image, we need to get it from the public folder, and then we can say product image path, just like that. That'll delete essentially our image. And then we can say that our image path is going to be equal to this brand new path. I'll just copy up this code because this should be exactly the same. So I'll paste that in just like that and I'll delete this down here. So now what essentially is happening, if I make sure I fix that, is we're defaulting to our default image path that's currently there. But if we pass up a new image, we delete the old one and create a brand new one. Then all I need to do is change this to update, pass along a where clause for our ID, just like that. And then finally, we're redirecting to that particular page. So now this should work. If I just add a two to the end of this, let's make our price two cents more expensive. This will say description. And let's just say that we only change our file here to be a file one, but we're not gonna change this. This will still be our O2 file. So now if we give that a quick save, of course, this is saying it is required. That's because I think I made those changes after. So I need to refresh my page. Let's add a two to the end of all of these. This will say description. And then finally, I'll change my image to the number one image, click save. And of course it's still saying required, so we have a problem. This I believe is coming from our schema. So let's make sure that our schema is being used correctly. So we have our edit schema right here. Our edit schema is coming from our add schema and you can see it's overriding our file and our image section. That is all correct, but I just realized I think I know what the problem is. In our form, we're not actually using the update function. We're always using the add function. So here, if our product, is equal to null, then use the add function, otherwise use the update function. But this update product function takes an ID, so we need to bind that ID. So by saying bind, passing in null, and then passing in our product ID, we're essentially changing the first property of this, our ID, and passing it in automatically. So that's why this is able to work. Now, if we give that a save, everything should work. If I click save, we should no longer get this required error. Click save, and you can see that it worked, and it's changed this to first product two, a thousand and two cents. And if I go to edit, you'll notice the image down here has a one while our actual text here still says two. So it has been properly changed just like we expected. Now we'll just go back to all of our products and let's make this available by activating it. Also, one thing I wanna make sure I do is inside of here, my is available for purchase should not be changed when I'm editing my product. That's why it changed it to essentially deactivated. Now let's minimize all these down and you can see everything inside of here is working just fine. Now the final thing we need to get to work is this download button right here. And this is actually not as complicated as you may think. If we go to this download route, what we can do is we can export an async function called git. This is going to be a git route. And this is going to take in a request, which is a next request, just like that. And what we wanna do inside of here is essentially just get all of our information. We're also gonna have some parameters. So we can say params ID, just like that and give this a type params, which is an ID, which is a string. There we go. So now inside of here, I can get my data, which is just gonna be my product. So we'll say db.product.findUnique, and I wanna get that based on the ID. So where ID, and I just wanna select essentially my file path. There we go, file path, true, name, true. Perfect. We'll just call this product. So it's a little bit more self-explanatory what this is. Then what I wanna do is if my data, or I'm sorry, my product is equal to null, then return not found because we were unable to find that product. But if we were able to find the product, then I wanna get all the information about the file. I need to get the size of the file, which comes from awaiting fs.stat, fs, which I probably should just import up here, from fs slash promises, there we go. So we can get fs.stat. This is going to give me the stats on my file. There we go. Then what I wanna do, make sure I call this product. Then what I wanna do below this is to actually get the information from this. So I wanna read my file. So I can say read file, just like that. That's gonna give me my file. And then I wanna get what the extension is for this file, which is just going to be coming from my product.filepath.split on the period. And I wanna just get the very last element by calling pop. 
this is just going to give me the file extension at the very end. So if it's .mp4, it'll give me mp4, for example. Now I can use this information to return a download link, essentially. So I can say return new next response. And this response is going to take whatever my file is. And then I just have some headers that explain what this file is. So the first header is going to be the content disposition. And this is essentially determining what the file name and so on is going to be. This is going to be specified as attachment semicolon. And then we want to say file name is equal to, and inside of quotes, we're going to put our product dot name. And then we want to add the extension onto that. So we'll say dot extension, just like that. So that's going to be what the default name for this file is going to be. Then I can pass down the content length, which tells the browser how long this file is. So it can give you things like download estimates. So we'll just say size.toString to convert that to a string. Now that should be all that we need to do to get this to work. So what I can come over here is I can click on this download link and it's going to redirect me out of the page. And you can see immediately it's trying to download that file. It gave it the name of first product 2srt So it got the actual file extension and everything correct. And I could click save and it would download that file for me. Now that takes care of everything on this products page. The next thing that I want to work on is actually making this admin page secure because right now everybody can access it, which is terrible. So what we're going to do is inside of this source folder, I'm going to create a brand new file called middleware.ts. And this is how we create middleware that runs before every single function or every single page call. So what we can do is we can export an async function, call it middleware, just like that. This is going to take in a request, which is a next request object. And inside of here, all that I want to do is I want to check if I'm on an admin page to specifically make sure that I'm logged in. So first I can export down here a config. So we'll say const config, and this is going to be equal to the URL route matcher. So I can say matcher just like this. And this matcher is going to be any admin route. So admin slash path star by adding this colon path star, this is saying get any individual page that is at my admin route or beyond. So it doesn't matter if it's slash admin, slash admin, slash products. If it has slash admin at the beginning, it's going to be falling under this middleware. So this is going to run anytime we try to access an admin page. So what I can do inside of here is I can first check to see if we are authenticated by creating a function. So we'll say function, this is gonna be an async function. This is gonna be is authenticated. Just like that, it's gonna take in our next request. Perfect. And this is going to determine if we are authenticated or not. So if we are not authenticated, so if await is authenticated is equal to false, well, then we know that we are not authenticated, so we have a problem. So we're gonna return essentially a new response. We'll make this a next response. There we go. And this next response is going to have text of unauthorized. And then we can specify the status is going to be 401 saying that we're not authorized. And also we can specify that we want to use a specific type of authorization. So in the headers, what we can do is we can pass along the header www dash authenticate. And we pass in the value of basic, and this is going to use basic authentication. And this is actually something that's built into the browser. So we don't even need to write our own authentication at all, which is really, really cool. So now in our is authenticated function, let's just return false for now to see exactly what is happening. And of course, we want to make sure that this is a promise. So we'll say promise.resolve just because it's an async function. There we go. And we'll make sure that we come in here and we pass in our request. And now if we give that a save, you'll notice immediately I get this sign in box popping up that's going to ask me for some type of username and some type of password. And if I try to sign in, you know, I'm always getting a failure here because this is just returning false. So what I want to do is I want to get that username and password and compare it to whatever the username and password is I care about. Now, this type of authentication is not great for customer facing stuff, but this is our admin page. I don't care how ugly it is. It's super convenient. It works really well and requires almost no code to get set up, which is ideal. So here, let's actually go through the code to determine how we are authenticated or not. So first we need to get the header for this. So we can say const auth header is equal to, this is gonna be from our request.headers, and it's going to be the authorization header, just like that. And we also wanna make sure we check the authorization header with a capital A as well. It may come back one way or the other. So just checking for both is really nice. Then if our auth header is equal to null, well, that means that we didn't actually pass along anything. So we should return false and tell the browser, hey, make sure that you try to authenticate the user. If we do have something though, I wanna check to see if the username and password are correct. So we're gonna get the username and password from this. 
we're going to take our auth header and we're going to split this on a space just like that. Then what I want to do is I want to convert this to a buffer. So we'll say buffer.from just like that. And the reason for this is because this is actually encoded, it's encrypted, and we need to decrypt these values. So by saying that we convert it to a buffer, we're going to change it from base 64. So it's not actually like securely encrypted or anything like that. We're just essentially saying, hey, convert this down to a buffer based on base 64. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get essentially the second value in that string. Now, the reason we're getting the second value from this is because the auth header looks something like this. It'll say basic, and then it'll have whatever your base 64 encoded string is afterwards. So we're essentially just getting this second portion by using this property right here. Now, the next thing I want to do is now that I have a buffer that I know is base 64 encoded, I want to convert it to a normal string. So this is essentially going to decode this value for me. And I'm going to split it on a colon. And that's because what's going to happen is the decoded value will look something like this. It'll be username, password, just like that. So I essentially want to use a colon to split these apart. So now I have my username and my password. And if I just do a quick console log of username, password, just like this, and I look at my console and I come in here and I type in admin and I type in password and I click sign in, you'll notice I get admin and password being printed out. So now I can use that information to determine if this is true or false. Right now it logged me in because essentially I was returning true from here, even though technically I didn't actually have anything being correct yet. So instead, what I want to do is I want to return a check. And essentially that check is going to take my username and check to see if it's equal to my process.env.admin username. So what I can do inside of my env variable, I can create an admin username, we can call it whatever we want. I'm just going to call it admin. Obviously, make it more secure than that. But for our cases, this was just for testing, it's going to be perfectly fine. So now if our username is correct, this will return true. But we also want to make sure that our password is correct as well. And I'm going to create a function called is valid password just like that. And this is actually going to be an asynchronous function. So we're going to make sure that we await calling this is valid password. And what this is going to do is it's going to take in my password, as well as my process.env.hashed admin password. There we go. And I want to convert I want to make sure I say that this is a string. There we go. Now, the reason I'm forcing this to be a string is because by default, this could be string or undefined. So I'm just forcing it to be a string. It's not really super important. So now let's create this is valid password. I'm going to create this in my lib folder here. So we'll say is valid password.ts export function is valid password. And this takes in a password as well as a hashed password. And these are both strings. So let's just type these out just like that. Now, the reason that this was an asynchronous function, we can make this async just like that, is because what it's going to do is it's going to return calling a function called has password, which we're going to create in just a second. And this is going to take in our password, and it's going to check to see if it's equal to our hashed password, just like that. And we're going to await that function. So down here, function hash password, make sure I spell it properly up here. There we go. Takes in a password, which is a string. And all I want to do is take this and I want to encrypt it in a way that is impossible to decrypt, which is what hashing is. So what we can do is we can say we want to create an array buffer. And this array buffer, if I can spell that properly, is just await. And we're going to say crypto dot subtle dot digest. Digest is essentially a keyword for hash. We're going to use the SHA-512 hashing algorithm, which is essentially just a way of changing our password into something that's difficult to discern and impossible to decrypt. And then we're going to pass in here essentially a new text encoder, and we're going to encode our text. So we're going to say encode our password. Now, I know this is kind of complicated what this is doing, but just copy this code word for word, and it should work fine. Essentially, all I'm doing is I'm taking my password, and I'm encrypting it into something that is very difficult and almost impossible to decrypt. That way, people cannot decrypt what our password is. Then I'm going to take our my buffer. I'm going to say buffer from my array buffer, and I'm going to essentially convert it to a base64 string because this is going to be a very, very long string. So by encoding it to base64, it just shrinks it down a little bit because this is a very long string. So now with that out of the way, I can actually show you what this does inside of our middleware. So for now, I'm just going to comment out this return statement. I'm just going to say is valid password, just like that. I'm going to pass it in my password and we'll just pass it in some junk. It doesn't really matter. All I want to do is I want to actually show you what's being executed from here. So here, I can just console log all of our information. So I can say console.log hash password with my password, just like that. So I can show you what this hashed version of the password looks like. So now if I try to refresh this page, you'll notice it's actually considering me currently logged in. So what I can do in my middleware is just return false 
There we go. So we can actually pass in what our information is. And in here, I'm gonna pass in the password of password. And I'm gonna click sign in. And you can see it's printing out the hashed version of that password. So I'm actually just gonna copy that and bring that into my environment variables. And this is our admin hashed password. I'm gonna put that in here as the value. So now this is our hashed password. Technically, you don't have to go through all these steps of hashing it. You can just type in password just like this and it'll work fine. The reason I'm hashing this is because in case I accidentally commit this env variable, for example, I've already forgotten to add it to my git ignore, so it would technically have been committed if I forgot to do that. It at least doesn't expose my admin password. I would still want to change it, but at least it gives me a little bit of extra security. So now with all that out of the way, in my middleware, I can come in here, I can bring this check back in, make sure I remove this and this up here, and now hopefully our code should be working. I just wanna make sure I fix any parentheses problems I have, give that a save, and it looks like it works. So now if I just cancel this, you'll notice it no longer is rendering this page for me. And if I type in admin and I type in the wrong password, click sign in, it should hopefully not work. But if I type in admin and password and click sign in and make sure I spell that properly and sign in, you notice it's still not quite working. I think it's because I need to do a refresh on my page to actually make sure things work. And in my in is valid password, make sure all that is working fine. So now let's try that again. Admin password and click sign in. And it's still not working. The reason it's not working is because I called this hashed admin password instead of admin hashed password. So now admin password, sign in. And it looks like it didn't work again. Give it a refresh just to make sure. Admin password, sign in. And what I may need to do is just stop my server and restart it. So now admin, password, sign in. And hopefully that should work this time. And as you can see, it did actually work that time. So I just had to restart my server because my environment variables changed. So now you can see that I'm logged in. And the really great thing about using this basic authentication is it'll work until you essentially close your browser and reopen it. So you can see I don't have to re-authenticate on every page. It just stays authenticated until I close my browser and reopen it. Then I'd have to type those credentials back in. Now that takes care of most of our admin pages. We'll come back and do the customers and sales in a bit while we have data to actually work with them. But for now, I wanna work on what our actual main customer facing pages are going to look like. So to get started on those, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna create a separate folder in our app, and this is going to be a route group called customer, or actually customer facing, there we go. So we know that these are all the pages facing the customer and our admin folders for all of our admin pages. Now by doing a route group with these parentheses, it won't change our URL, but allows us to create like a custom layout for all these pages. So I can create a layout.tsx inside of here, and this is actually gonna be pretty similar to our admin one. So I'm just gonna copy our admin route I'm gonna paste it into here because it's going to be very similar, except for obviously our links are going to be different. So we're gonna have a home link just like that. We're then going to have a link for our products. And then we're gonna have a link for the user to download their order history. So we'll say my orders, products, and just like that. Now all we need to do to actually see this in action is to create a page.tsx. There we go. And in our layout, I'll make sure that I call this something like layout instead of admin layout. And now inside of here, export a default function. This is gonna be called home page. And we can just return an H1 that says hi. And as you can see, we now have home products and my orders as our nav links. While if we're on the admin pages, you can see we get a different nav bar at the top. That's why I have essentially two different layouts and two different folders. Now for our home page, essentially I want to have two separate sections. I wanna have a section with the most popular products and a section with the newest products. So I'm just gonna create functions for getting both of those. We'll say get newest products. Make sure I spell that all correctly. There we go. This is going to return db dot. Make sure I import db. We wanna get our products and we essentially want to get all of them. So we'll say find many. I want to specifically sort them. So I'm going to say order by. And in this case, I want to order it by how many orders we have actually gotten. So I can go to my orders and I can get the count. So I want to essentially order by how many I've gotten. And here I want to order in a descending order. And also I want to only get the products that are available for purchase. So where products, or I'm sorry, where available for purchase is true. And make sure I add in my comma right there. So now I'm getting only the available to purchase products and I'm ordering by the ones that have the most amount of orders. And I wanna just get six of them. So I'm just gonna show the first six on the page. Now I'm gonna do essentially the exact same thing for most popular. So this was actually get most popular most popular. 
And now for get newest, instead of ordering by the amount of orders we've gotten, we're just gonna order by the created at date. And in this case, we're gonna do the descending order. Now for my actual homepage, I'm essentially just gonna have two different sections and they're gonna be two different grids. So here I'm gonna have a div. And actually, I'm just gonna make this my main content because that is technically what it is. And I'm gonna add in a class name here, space y12 to give them a ton of space in between them. And then I'm gonna have a product grid section, just like that. And I'm essentially going to have two of these product grid sections, one for my newest and one for my most popular. So let's create this product grid section just like that. And I'm going to make sure that I actually do some suspense loading boundaries inside of here. So instead of passing down my products by awaiting this, I'm gonna pass down the function to get them. So I'm gonna say products fetcher is equal to, and we'll say this is the get most popular. And I can copy this down to here. And this is gonna be the exact same thing, but it's gonna be get newest products instead. So this is gonna take in a products fetcher which is going to be, if I do my type for my product grid section props, that product fetcher is going to be a function that returns to me a promise, and that promise is going to be essentially a product array, just like that, and this product comes directly from Prisma. I'm also going to be passing in a title here, so now I can do my product grid section props, and the title is just going to be a string that we put, so title, string. There we go. So now we can actually write out what the code for this will look like. So let's create a div here for some spacing. We'll say space y is four, just to space out our title from our grid. And then we'll come in here with another div. This one's going to be a flex based grid with a gap of four. And this is where our title is going to go as well as a button to view all of our products. So let's put an h2 that has our title, just like that. And we'll add some classes so it looks relatively good. Text is going to be three XL and we'll make it some bold font. Here we go. So now if we pass in a title to one of these, for example, newest, actually this is most popular. There we go. And this one is gonna have a title that says newest. There we go. Give that a quick save. And then down here, I just wanna make sure I return this div so it'll actually work. And now you can see it says most popular and newest. Now we need to add in our button. And this button, just like this, is going to be a as child button. And that's just because we're gonna be rendering a link inside of it. So we're gonna render out a link that says view all, just like that. And this is gonna be an href that goes to our products page. And let's make sure that we import this link from next, just like that. Now for our button, I'm gonna add some classes to it. This one is, or not classes, sorry, this is gonna be a variant. And it's going to be the outline variant. So we're gonna have an outline button. And then I'm also going to change a little bit how our link actually works because our link is going to be a class name of space x2. And that's because I'm, instead of just having our text like this, I'm gonna put this inside of a span, I'm also going to have a little arrow icon just to kind of emphasize that it's going to the right. So arrow, right, just like that. And we'll say class name size four. There we go. So now we just have that arrow off to the right, looks relatively good. And that's the entire section here for our like title. Then we can move on to our grid. So div class name, and this grid is essentially going to work just like the grid that we used on our admin page. I'm just gonna copy that grid because like I said, it's the same grid, same exact code. So I'm gonna come all the way up to here where we have our grid, which is actually on this page here. So I'm gonna open this up. You can see all my code for my grid. I'm just gonna copy that because again, it's the exact same grid style layout. And it's nice that we can just kind of repeat this across the page. So there's our grid, close that off. And now inside of here, I essentially want to have a product card. There we go for each one of my different products, just like that. Now this product card is a component we're probably gonna use multiple places. I know for a fact we'll use it on the home and products page, and you could see yourself using it in many places in an application. So we'll put it inside our components folder, product card.tsx, export function product card, just like that. And inside this product card, we'll just come in here, we'll return a card, make sure we get that from the correct location, close that off. We're gonna need to have our card header, just like that. Inside of here, we have our card title, which is going to contain our actual name of our product. So we'll make sure that we get our name as one of our props. We're then going to have the description, card description, just like that. And this is actually going to be the price. So we'll get our price in cents. And we'll make sure here we format our currency of our price in cents divided by 100. There we go. Next, we're gonna render out our card content, just like that. 
And for this, I'm actually gonna put a flex grow class on here. So I'll say flex grow, just like that. And that's because I want this to actually grow to fill the full size of the container. And to make that work, we'll make our class for this actually be flex. We'll change the overflow to hidden as well. And we'll make sure it flex in the column direction. Now, the reason we're adding overflow hidden is because I'm gonna add an image and I wanna make sure the rounded corners of our card cut off our image. Now inside of here, let's add a P tag. And this P tag is just gonna have our description, just like that. And importantly, I wanna make sure that I line clamp this to be just four lines long so it doesn't become too long. So up here, let's just add that description. There we go. Now the final thing I wanna do in my card footer is I wanna add in a button just like that. Make sure I import this. And this button is going to be a purchase button and that's just gonna be a link to a new page. So it'll say purchase. Make sure I import my link just like that. And the href for this is essentially going to be slash products slash, and this is going to be my ID of my product, slash purchase, just like that. And our button should be as child. The size of this is going to be large because I want it to be the most important thing on the page. And I'm also going to make it fill the entire width by adding a W full class to it. Now, if we make sure we get our ID in here, that is everything we need except for the image. So let's go ahead and add our image. We're actually going to put it inside of a div so that I can actually fill the full size we need. And then we'll put our image inside of there. So get our next image, just like that. Make sure our source is going to be our image path, which again comes from up here, image path, there we go. And then we need to specify our width and height, or we can just say fill to fill the entire container. And the alt on this is going to be whatever our name is. So to make it fill our container, we need to give this a position of a relative. So we're gonna say relative on here. We're gonna say it's gonna be a full width and the height on this is going to be auto. And we're gonna make the aspect ratio video. So it's gonna be a 16 by nine aspect ratio essentially. So now we can create our type for our props. We'll say product card props, come up here, type product card props. And our ID is a string, name is a string, price in cents is a number, and our description is a string. And then finally, image path is a string as well. There we go. So that cleans up everything inside of here. You can see there are no errors at all, which is great. So now we can actually render out this product card. We just need to make sure we pass it in a product. So we're gonna loop through all of our products. So we're gonna have our product fetcher. For now, I'm just gonna do this in line here. We'll move it around in a little bit, but we can just await fetching all of our different products. And we can add in a simple dot then here, make sure that this is a sync. And this should not be a dot then, this should be a dot map. There we go. So for each product, what I want to do is render out that product card, pass it a key, which is my product.id, and then pass it my product. There we go. You can see there are no errors. And now if we look over here, you can see our products are showing up. If I just make this a little bit wider, you can see we only have one product currently showing up, and it's just because we have one product. If we had more than one product, you would see multiple products showing up. So if we go to our admin page and we go to the product section, we can just add a brand new product. We'll call it second. This one is going to have a price of $200. Random description doesn't matter. And we'll just choose, let's say this is going to be number one and number one. Again, it doesn't really matter. We can give that a quick save. We can activate this product. And now if we go back to our normal homepage, you can see now we have both those products. They have the exact same image. So let's go ahead and actually change the image. So we'll edit this one right here to have a different image. We'll use image number two for this one. There we go. Give that a quick save. And now if we go back to our main page, you can see we have both of our products, one with the image one, one with the image two, and they're currently being sorted in order. I can show you by moving my camera out of the way that you can see that they are being sorted in order where the newest one is on the farthest left, oldest one's on the farthest right. And since they both have zero orders, you can see they just have a random ordering up here for most popular. Let me bring my image back here. Now this works great, but what I wanna do is I wanna add a skeleton loading animation to this page. So what I'm gonna do is go to my product card here and I'm gonna add a second export here. This one's gonna be exporting a function called product card skeleton. There we go. And this product card skeleton is essentially going to look just like this card here, but it's going to be a skeletonized version. I'm actually gonna copy the code for this so you don't have to watch me type it all out and I'll explain what it looks like. So as you can see here, we have the exact same structure for our card. The main difference is in all the places where we had a text or an image, we replaced it with a div. So here we have a div that is an aspect video width full and a background color of 300 gray. Same thing here, we just have a random div, which is a height of six and a width of three quarter. Here we have a width of half and a height of four. So we have very different heights of images and text and so on. So it's essentially emulating what our card will look like. 
and we added this animate pulse class to make the entire thing pulse in and out. So now if we use this product card skeleton, you'll see exactly what that looks like. I'll just replace our product card with the skeleton version, give it a save and make sure that I import this and you'll actually see what I'm talking about. You can see that it has this kind of look for when we're loading and it looks really good. It's like a skeleton loading animation of what our product would look like. And the way that this works is just adding a bunch of rectangles that are gray and make them animate in and out. That's how all of this styling works. So what we wanna do is render our cards when everything is loaded. And when it's not loaded, we render that skeleton fallback. So to do that, the best way is going to be with suspense. So if you want to render something with suspense like that, you need to make sure that the component you're rendering is the async component, is the code that's doing the awaiting. So essentially here, I'm gonna put a suspense boundary. And inside of here, I would normally put this code right here. But the problem is, is that I'm using my await inside this async function, so the suspense isn't gonna work properly. So instead I need to create a brand new function. We'll make this an async function, and we'll just call this product suspense, just like that. There we go. And what it's gonna do is just take this code right here, and it's gonna return it. There we go, return that exact code right there, and it's gonna take in that product fetcher, just like that. And the type of that product fetcher is just right here, so I'll just copy that type. There we go. So it's taking in that product fetcher and it's calling it just like that. And actually I called it products fetcher, there we go. So it's just returning to us all of our product cards. And the reason we need to do this is because we need our async await to be in a separate component. So now I can put that code inside this suspense and the suspense will work properly where it actually shows me my fallback. So I called this product suspense and I need to pass in my product fetcher just like that. And now inside my suspense, I can have a fallback. And this fallback is going to be very straightforward. I'm essentially just gonna render that product skeleton so product card skeleton, just like that. And I'm just gonna render three of them, let's say. So now when I'm in the loading state, it's gonna show three of these skeleton loaders. Otherwise it's gonna show my cards down here. Now to make sure this all works properly, I should just be able to remove the async from this function right here. Make sure that this is my only asynchronous function and my suspense boundary should work just fine. Where when I refresh my page, it should show me the actual skeleton loading version. Now this is a bit difficult to see. So let's just create a really simple wait function to actually slow this down a little bit. We'll say function wait, we're gonna say it's a duration, which is a number, and we'll return a new promise, resolve, which calls set timeout with that resolve and the duration. There we go, super straightforward. There we go. So now this is a wait function, and I'm gonna make these wait for a different amount of times. So I'll say this one's gonna wait for two seconds, and the one above it is gonna wait for one second. So this is just a really easy way to test what happens if we slow down the browser, make these both asynchronous. There we go. And now if I give this a quick refresh, you can see that we're getting that skeleton loading. And the first one actually pops in first at the top here because it's a one second delay, while the one at the bottom is a two second delay. So again, you can see that skeleton loading, which looks really good. Obviously, I don't want to have any artificial delays in here. So I'm just gonna remove that, remove this wait function. That's just so we could see how this works. And that's all we need to do for this products homepage. And the really great thing is our main products page is actually going to be very simple because it's going to be essentially this product grid right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take this product grid, I'm just gonna take the grid section, I'm gonna copy it, and I'm gonna create a brand new page for this. So inside of here, a new folder called products, and inside of that, I'm gonna have page.tsx. Then we can export a function called products page. And inside of here, I essentially just want to return this code right here. So we're gonna get our suspense boundary, we're gonna make sure we get this skeleton as well as our normal product card. So this here should be our product card, just like that. And actually we can leave this how it was before. So we can actually go back to where we had the product suspense. We'll call this products suspense. I'll copy this down. This is gonna be a function called products suspense. And inside of here, I'm gonna essentially loop through all my products. So I can say const products equals, and I wanna get all my products. So we'll call get products just like that. Let's create that function. There we go, get products. This is gonna return db.products.findmany. And we wanna get only the ones that are available for purchase. So where is available for purchase is true. There we go. So now we can come in here, await that. Make sure that that is asynchronous. So now we have our products. So now our product suspense is going to use those products. Make sure I spelled all this properly, there we go. And now here, I'm just going to loop through my products. So products.map, make sure that's on my return statement. There we go. For each product, I wanna return my product card. 
there we go. The key is product.id, and then we just spread out our product. And there we go. Make sure I get all my typos fixed up here. That should be all we need to do. This should say product.id, there we go. Now you can see that that's working. There's no errors here. Let's make it so that there's like six skeletons that show up just because this is a larger page. That's the only thing on the page. Now, if we refresh, we need to make sure, of course, that this is a default export. And now you can see we have our products showing up and they're just going to be ordered however we want. So in our case, let's order them by name. So we'll say here, order by name. And let's do this in ascending order. There we go. So now we have all of our products show up and they're gonna be sorted by name. So this takes care of our products page and our home page. And the My Orders page is gonna be a really simple page, which is just an email field where you specify your email and we'll email you your products and download links. Now, before we move on to being able to purchase and email order links and so on, the thing that I wanna work on next is dealing with caching inside of Next.js because right now everything is super heavily cached by Next.js and I wanna make sure that we're using that caching while still making sure whenever things change on the admin panel, for example, we're updating all of our different pages. So to deal with caching in Next.js, I'm actually gonna create a helper function that'll do all of the caching for us. So we can say this is gonna be called cache.ts. This is gonna export a function called cache, just like that. And this cache function is going to essentially take in three different parameters. The first is going to be our callback. The second is going to be something called our key parts. And then finally, we have our options that we're gonna be passing into this. Now this cache function is essentially emulating the next cache function that's built in. So if we come in here, we can export, or sorry, import, the cache function, which is called unstable cache, and that's coming directly from next cache, and we'll call this next cache. And there's a second cache we need to worry about, which is from React. So we can import cache directly from React, just like that. And I'm gonna rename this as the React cache. So these are two different levels of caching that we need to worry about. One is for request memoization, and the other one is for dealing with the data cache and everything else built into Next.js. Now, if you wanna learn more about these caching mechanisms, I have a full blog article covering them in super depth, so I'll link that in the description for you. But in the purposes of this video, all we need to do is make sure we wrap whatever our callback is inside of both of these different caches. And if we look at the next cache, you'll notice that this takes in a callback, key parts, and options, essentially the exact same things right here. So I'm actually just copying these types directly from this next cache function. So what we can do is first create a type called callback. Again, this is directly from that next cache. And this is just going to take in any number of arguments and we don't care what the parameters on those are, just like that. And this is always going to return to us a promise with the type of any, there we go. Again, we don't care about what any of these parameters are. We just want a function that takes something and returns something. And then here, we're gonna say T is going to extend that callback. So we're gonna have some type of generic T type that is extending that callback. And that is the type of this callback right here. Our key parts here is just an array of strings. And then our options is a little bit more complicated here. This is gonna have two options, revalidate. This is going to be a number and it's going to be optional. This is essentially how many seconds before we actually revalidate. It could also be false. And then we're also going to come in here with tags. And these tags are just essentially a string array. And this again is going to be optional. And by default, this is going to equal an empty object. There we go. So now we have all of this set up. What we can do is we can call next cache and we can pass it inside of here, our React cache. And inside of that, we can pass it in our callback, our key parts, and our options. So essentially all we're doing is we're making sure we first cache this using React, and then we're caching it using next and passing in all of these different parameters. The reason I'm creating a helper function for this is so I don't have to always import both caches into my function and wrap both of them. That makes it a little bit more confusing and difficult to work with. So now let's go ahead and actually look at what this looks like in implementation. I'll go essentially to any of our product pages. We'll just minimize pretty much everything. We'll go to our very first home page. And our home page has two separate functions, get most popular and get newest. We wanna cache both of these. So the easiest way to use this cache is to convert these from normal functions to a constant variable and set that equal to calling our custom cache function and passing in this function as an arrow function. So that's the first step. The next step is going to be passing it in essentially our array, which is going to be our array for our key parts. This is an array that must be unique because anytime you have the same array for two different functions that you're caching, it's going to put them in the exact same place. So this is like a unique identifier. The way I like to really easily uniquely identify this is based on the route to this particular page. So this is on our homepage. So we'll just use slash as the route and then we'll use the actual name of the function. 
Now, obviously, if you wanted to have two database calls that are exactly the same on different pages, this wouldn't work super well. But in our case, every single database call on our pages is unique. And if I ever had a shared database call, I would put it inside my database folder here for ease of use. So now you can see that has cleaned this up perfectly. And for this get most popular products, I only really want to revalidate this every single 24 hours or so, because I don't really care about getting this up to date every second. I just care, you know what, every day, tell me what the most popular products are for the entirety of that day. It can stay exactly the same. So here I can change revalidate here to just be 60 times 60 times 24. And that's essentially going to be one day in seconds. So every single day, this is going to invalidate the cache and get a brand new value for it. Now I can do the exact same thing down here for my newest products. That's going to be equal to calling cache, passing it in this arrow function, making sure I spell const properly. And then down here, we of course need our key parts and we're gonna do the exact same thing where I just use the name of the function that's going to work perfectly fine for this use case. So now both of these are cached, which is really great. So it's gonna be a little bit quicker to load. We can do the exact same thing on our products page as well. So here we can change this to a constant variable. That's going to be equal to calling cache, make sure we get our cache, turn this into an arrow function, just like that. And our key parts, this is gonna be slash products. And then we'll just use the name here, get products. There we go. So now this is going to be cached as well. The important thing about this caching though, is that we need to make sure we invalidate the cache whenever we actually change what the underlying data is. So in our admin actions, for example, if we were to add a new product, for example here, or we edit, or we delete, or we update a product, we need to make sure that we revalidate these caches. So what we need to do is just wherever we go at the very bottom, whenever we're doing our redirect, that's the perfect time to revalidate a path. So in our case, we're gonna revalidate our homepage as well as our products page, because those both deal with our products. So whenever we add a new product, we're essentially removing that cache and forcing it to get the data again. Same thing here with update. Whenever we update a product, we're saying, you know what? invalidate that cache, get all the data again. Same exact thing here for toggling if the product's available, make sure we also do the revalidation. And if we delete a project, obviously we need to revalidate as well. So now with that done, that takes care of all of our caching needs. So now this page will always be cached. It should load incredibly quickly, but if we run into an instance where, for example, we add a new product, delete a product, and so on, it'll make sure to revalidate these pages. So now that we have all that done, the next thing to work on is going to be making this purchase button actually link to the correct page and actually set up our purchase. So as you can see, it's at product slash ID slash purchase. So we can at least create the page for that. So inside of our app in that products section, we'll create a folder for ID. This is a dynamic route. And then inside of here, we'll create that products, or sorry, purchase slash page.tsx. There we go. Export default function purchase page. And for now, we can just return the text of hi inside of an h1 just to see if this is working. So if we save, this should actually refresh. Now we can see we're on that correct page. Now, obviously, to get set up with this page, we need to actually get the parameter for our ID. So that comes from our params ID. And we'll give that a quick type here. Params is an ID, which is a string. Now that we have that, we can actually get our product from here. So we can say our product is going to be equal to awaiting. And let's make this an async function so we can actually use these server functions inside of here. We'll say db.product, and we want to find a unique one based on our ID. So where our ID is that ID. There we go. So now we have our product. And if for some reason we don't have a product, we can't find one then we're just gonna return not found because obviously we can't purchase something if there is no product to purchase. There we go. Now the next step after we get all that done is going to be actually implementing Stripe. Now, unfortunately, the Stripe documentation is not updated with the newest Next13 app router. As you can see, they're still using the pages directory for everything, but I've gone through, converted this all over to the server directory and the app router way of doing things so that it's going to be the most up-to-date and modern way of doing things. Now, if we scroll down, you can see we essentially have two parts when it comes to Stripe. We have the server portion of Stripe, and then later on, we're going to be dealing with the client portion of Stripe. The server is where you set up all your payments and make sure everything is authenticated properly. And the client is just where you show the actual card information for people to enter their credit card email and so on. So we're going to go through the server setup first. And really all we need to do is install the Stripe and at Stripe slash Stripe JS libraries. So let's go ahead and install both of those libraries into our application. We can just come in here, close that out, and we can make sure we install both of these. There we go. These are going to be used purely on the server for us to do all of our server related interactions. 
And if we look over on the page, essentially the main thing that we need to do is to create a payment intent. Essentially we're saying, hey, I intend to purchase something for a specific price. As you can see, it has all the code over here for doing that. Now I'm not gonna go through this documentation step by step just because like I said, it's not updated for the newest version of Next.js, but I will show you the code that actually works with the newest version of Next.js, which is a little bit cleaner than their documentation. Now, the first thing we need to do is actually get Stripe. So we're gonna import Stripe from, and that's coming from the Stripe library. So we can just type in Stripe like that. And then we need to create a brand new Stripe object. So we can say Stripe is equal to creating a new Stripe object. And here is we need to pass in our secret Stripe API key. That's why this must occur on the server and not on the client. So we can say process.env.stripe secret key. Now, in order to get what our secret key and our public key are going to be, if we go to Stripe and we click on this dashboard link right here, this will bring us to our dashboard where we can log in and everything. And then once I log in, you can see that we'll be brought to the actual test dashboard just like this. And here, I don't actually wanna get anything set up right now because this is for like activating your account for live purchases. And this is purely for testing. But what I can do is click on this API keys for developer link. And this is gonna bring me directly to where my public key and my secret key are going to be. Now, once I actually confirm my password, you'll notice here that I have my keys showing up. These keys I'm going to be deleting after this video goes live. So you won't be able to use these keys yourself, but you can create your own keys. But essentially we just wanna copy this and put this into our environment variables. So we'll find our ENV here and we're gonna have our Stripe secret key, set it equal to that, and our Stripe public key, and we'll set it equal to our public key up here. And since we wanna make sure that this public key is actually accessible on the client, we need to make sure we prefix it with the next underscore public underscore. If we do that prefix, that'll make it so it's available both on the server and on the client, while all these will only be available on the server. And I like to just separate them in my ENV variable files so I know which ones are public and which ones are going to be only on the server. So now with that out of the way, the next thing we need to work on is creating that purchase intent. And I'm just gonna manually cast this to a string just so I get rid of all those TypeScript errors. So a purchase intent is just you telling Stripe, I have a customer that is intending to purchase something at a specific price. So what we can do down here is we can say that we want to do Stripe, dot payment intents and what we want to do is we want to create a brand new payment intent and here's where you specify all the information you want as you can see there's a ton of stuff first of all we need our amount and this is going to be in cents so we can say our product dot price in cents that's going to give us exactly what we need for our amount we also need to specify the currency which in our case is us dollars and then you can add in additional metadata and this metadata is really useful if you want to tie a purchase to something. For our case, we want to tie this purchase to this particular product. So in our metadata, we're actually gonna pass along the product ID as our product.id, just like that. So now we're creating this brand new payment intent. We'll just come in here, payment intent, just like that. And this payment intent is for a specific amount. It's in US dollars, and it's going to have this metadata passed along with it. That way, after the charge has been processed and everything, we'll be able to use this metadata to hook up our customer with the product that they're actually purchasing. This metadata section is really important. Now with this payment intent, the thing that we really care about from this, there's a lot of information, but the thing we care about is the client secret, because this is what we use on the client to essentially say that this is the payment intent they're working on. You can almost think about this as like an ID for this particular payment intent. Now this client secret technically can be null, so we're just gonna do a quick check to see if this is equal to null. If it's equal to null, then there was some type of problem going on, so we're just gonna throw an error. That says Stripe failed to create payment intent just something to essentially say that something failed like this should never happen but just in case it does this is what we're going to do and then i'm going to create a brand new form we're going to call this checkout form and the reason i'm creating this as its brand new component is just because it's going to be a client component since it's going to be using a lot of hooks on the client side for stripe and so on and here we're going to be passing down my product so we'll say product is our product and we're also going to be passing along that client secret which is just our payment intent dot client secret just like that so now we can create this checkout form i'm just going to do it directly inside of here in a components folder we'll call this checkout form dot tsx export function checkout form and it takes in our product and our client secret just like that checkout form props so now we can come up here we can type our checkout form props and we can say our product is going to be whatever it's going to be. We'll figure that out in a second and we'll get our client secret, which is a string. There we go. And let's just make sure we close this off and return h1 that says form. There we go. So now inside of here, we can make sure we import that. There we go. 
and now everything should be working, no more errors. Now, if we just go ahead and actually look at what we need to do for Stripe, I'll just expand this a little bit. We got all of this server related stuff done for creating our payment intent relatively easy. The next step is going to be building out the checkout page and we're gonna be using React obviously. So we need to install this library for React. So we can just copy this exact library right here that we need to install. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna come into our application npm i and install that library just like that. Once that's done, we can restart our server. So npm run dev, there we go. Now we have our server working. Let's open up our checkout form so we can actually start working on that. And let's look at what the code is going to look like for this section. So the very first thing that we need to do is we need to call this load Stripe function and pass it in our public key. And this essentially is going to load Stripe on the client. So we have a server version of Stripe, which allows us to do things like creating payment intents. And then we have a client side version, which allows us to process payments for our user based on those payment intents. So if we scroll down a little ways, we can essentially ignore this entire section up here. And you'll notice that right here, there's this thing called elements, which is what's going to be handling all of the different checkout related stuff for us. Then if we look inside the checkout form, the main thing we care about here is this client secret right here. So we need to make sure we use that client secret when we initialize our content. So if we scroll all the way down here, where we're actually rendering out all of our element related stuff, we're gonna be using the client secret down here. So I'll show you exactly what all that looks like. It's not important you understand how all of this documentation looks like. Just know that that's kind of what we're doing to hook everything up together. So I'm gonna bring this off to the side and I'll start writing out the code inside of here. So we need to use elements. So we're gonna say elements, and this is coming directly from that Stripe React library we just installed. And the key thing about elements is it's going to take one major property or actually two. The first is going to be our options and the options requires our client secret, which we have right here. So that's perfectly fine. The next is it's going to require an instance of Stripe, just like this. Now this Stripe instance is coming from our actual loading Stripe call. So we can say load Stripe, just like that. We can pass it along our process.env.next underscore public underscore stripe public key. That's what we called this key. We'll just mark this as a string. And now we can say that const stripe is equal to calling load stripe. Then the really important thing to understand is inside this element, we actually need to create a second component because essentially this element is like a context wrapper that gives us the context for stripe and elements and so on. So let's create a brand new function. We'll just call this form. It really doesn't matter what we call this. And inside of here, we can use the hook use stripe which gives us essentially an instance of our Stripe variable. So we'll say Stripe is equal to that. And up here, I'm actually gonna call this Stripe promise, just because technically this returns to us a promise, which resolves to our Stripe instance. So down here by calling use Stripe, it actually gives us our Stripe instance that we need to use. Same thing here, we can use the use elements hook, and this allows us to hook up Stripe essentially. This use elements hook has all the details for our payment information, email, and so on. We can pass that along to Stripe and it's all going to work behind the scenes for us. We don't have to worry about managing all that or verifying it, Stripe does all of that for us. Now with that done, we can essentially render what we want. In our case, we want to render out the payment element. This again, comes directly from Stripe. And you'll notice just by using the payment element on its own, without even adding really any extra customization, we can come in here, we can render our form. You'll notice it'll actually look rather quite good. So we can come over to our application. We're gonna refresh this page and you'll see immediately we'll get a checkout form that shows up using Stripe. It has verification and everything built in. All we need to do is just add some extra bells and whistles around it to make it look nice. Now, obviously I forgot to mark this as a client component. So use client. That's just because the Stripe library uses a bunch of hooks behind the scenes. But you'll notice now we have this nice checkout form showing up with all the information we need, as well as multiple different ways that we can check out all built into Stripe. You can customize this as far as you want by removing things, adding things, making it look different with CSS. All of that can be done with the options you can pass inside of here. Like there's an entire appearance option for modifying exactly how everything looks. But in our case, the default actually looks really good and blends in with the styles we're using for our site. What I wanna do is I wanna work on focusing on adding information about what the product is we're purchasing before we dive further into the Stripe integration. So up here where we have our elements, I'm gonna add an entire section above this that's specifically dealing with showing out the information for our product. So we're gonna put this inside of a div and essentially I want it to look very similar to our card, but I'm gonna have an image on the left, content on the right hand side. And this first div, I'm actually gonna have wrap my entire container and that's because I wanna limit the size of this. So I'm gonna come in here with a class name. I'm gonna say that the max width of this is going to be 5XL, just so it's not too large. And I'm also gonna say the width is going to be 100%. And then I'm gonna center it with margin of auto. I'm gonna space out the content inside of here using space Y8. Now, just by doing that, you'll notice nothing changes because we're rather you know, small screened already. But if our screen was much larger, you would notice it would shrink down the size of this so it's not too big. That's essentially all this is doing, just making it so it's not too large. Now, the next thing I wanna do is to create a div that's going to contain all my product information. So this is going to be used Flexbox to lay things out with a gap of four. I'm gonna put the items in the center so everything is centered nice and neat. 
Now, the first thing we need is our image, and that's going to go inside of a div. So we're going to have our next image right here. That's going to be the image of our product. And then the next section that I want is going to be all of my product information. So let's start with our image first. We're going to have our product dot image path, just like that. And let's make sure we actually fill out the types for our product. So our image path is going to be a string. There we go. And we're going to have a name, which is a string and a price in cents, which is a number. And let's put our description in there. And this description is just going to be a string as well. So now that we have all that, we can specify what we want for this. We just want it to be a fill and the alt here is going to be our product dot name, just like that. So that's our image done. Now let's make sure it's the right size. We can say that we want it to be an aspect ratio of video. We want it to not be able to shrink at all. So we'll say flex shrink of zero. We'll give it a specific width of one third of the container size. And then we add relative on there to make sure our image shows up inside that section. So if we give that a quick save, we should see now we have our image at the very top showing up, which is great. And it's always gonna be one third of our size. Next, we can work on making sure all the content for our actual text shows up. So we're gonna have a div here with a text of large. This is going to be for the actual price that we're gonna be paying. This is the most important part, which is why I made it large for my currency. This is going to be our price in cents divided by 100. So now we should see we have the price showing up, which is great. The next step we need is going to be adding the actual name of my product. I'm going to put that in an h1 product.name. And then we're going to add some styles. So we can say here, the class name for this is going to be text 2 xl because this is going to be quite large, and a font of bold. So now you can see we have a product name showing up. And finally, we're going to add the description that can go inside of a div. And here we want to line clamp this. We'll just do three lines. We don't want it to be super long for the description. And then we can actually come in here and say the text, whoops, text is muted just like that. And we'll use the foreground one. So we can say product.description, close that off. And now you can see we have our description, we have the name and we have the price and the description will never get too long, which is exactly what we want. One last thing we wanna do as well with the image is to set a class name of object cover just to make sure that it doesn't overflow the container or do weird stretching. So now with that done, we can actually work on making our form look a little bit better at the bottom here. Cause right now we're just rendering out the blank payment element, which is super not ideal. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna put this inside of a form because obviously we want it to be a form that we can submit just like that. And then inside of this form, we're gonna essentially put this inside of a card. So we're gonna use the card components that we've already imported. So we have our card. Let's do our card header at the top here. We're gonna have our card title at the top of that. And this will just say checkout, there we go. And we're also going to have a card description. So we'll come in here with a card description. And this one, I'm gonna give a class name of text destructive. And this is where we're gonna put any type of error message that we get. So right now we're not gonna actually show this unless we have an error message. But for now, I'll just put the text error so we can see what it would look like. And as soon as we have an error message, we'll make sure we hide this or show it accordingly. Next up, we're gonna have the content of our card. And this is essentially just gonna be our checkout form. So I'm gonna move my payment element up into this. And then we're gonna put in a footer here. So we're gonna have a card footer. And this is going to be for our checkout button. So we're gonna have our button. This one's going to say purchase. And I'm also going to put the price inside of here as well. So we're going to say format. Let me make sure I do this correctly. There we go. Format currency price in cents divided by 100. There we go. And let's make sure we pass in that price in cents. Price in cents is a number. There we go. So now we at least have that information. Make sure I import my button just like that. And we'll add a few more classes to our button. For example, we'll make it full width. We'll make the size here be large, and then we'll deal with like disabling it and so on based on certain properties. So first of all, I wanna have this button be disabled if stripe equals null, or if our elements equals null, just like that. And that just means if either of these things are null, obviously that means the form is loading, so we should not actually show the purchase button. Now, as you can see, we have our checkout form, and if I move my camera out of the way, you can actually see that the purchase price is currently incorrect. That's because we need to make sure we pass in our price in cents, which is just our product dot price in cents. Now, if we give that a save, you can see that this price right here has actually been properly updated. Now I'm gonna move my camera back to where it was just because that's not really important for us to see at this moment. And now we wanna finish on working on our form and making sure it actually works properly so we can actually submit the form. And that again is going to be straight from the Stripe documentation. I'm not gonna walk you through the Stripe documentation. I'm just gonna show you how to do it. So really the main thing we need to focus on here is going to be an on submit handler. So we're gonna have on submit. And what this is going to do is just gonna call a function. We're just gonna call it handle submit. And this is going to do all of our stuff related to Stripe. So we're gonna come in here, handle submit. We're gonna say that that is a function. 
It's gonna take in a form event. And of course, the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prevent the default of that form event. Let's make sure we get this imported properly. There we go. And then what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that all the elements we need are there. So if stripe is equal to null or our elements is equal to null, then we just want to return because obviously there's a problem. We don't have stuff loaded up yet. So obviously we don't wanna submit our form. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna set is loading to true because we need to manually manage our own loading state. So here is loading, set is loading. We'll just default this, use state. Whoops, state, there we go. That's going to be false by default. And we can use that down here. For example, if we are in the loading state, then we of course want to make sure that this button is disabled and we can change our text down here too. If we are in the loading state, then we're gonna say purchasing dot, dot, dot. Otherwise we'll say purchase and we'll say the price just like we had before. There we go. Let's close that off, give that a quick save. And now our button will actually be able to update whenever we're in that loading state. If I click on this right now, you can see it actually changes to that text of purchasing and it grays itself out. But obviously since we're not doing anything in our form, the loading state is never being fixed. So let's just refresh that back to what we had before. Now, the first thing that we should do is check to see if the order exists. So check for existing order. Essentially, I don't want the customer to be able to purchase the same product twice. For now, we're gonna skip this step just so we can make sure we get the Stripe portion working and then we'll come back and fix this. So for Stripe, all we need to do is call confirm payment. So we can do that, we call confirm payment and we need to pass in all of the different elements that we have. So this will pass in all of our credit card information, expiration dates and so on. And then we need to pass in these confirm parameters. Now these confirm parameters essentially just takes in a return URL. So we're gonna come in here return URL. And this return URL tells us where to send the person after the purchase is complete. This is essentially like your success page for your purchase. So here we can just get the URL. So we'll say process.env.next public server URL, just like that. And then we can just add on to the end of this server URL, the actual page that we want to render. So here, this is just going to give us our URL to our server. So this would be like localhost 3000. And then what we can do is we can say we want to send them to the Stripe purchase success page. It doesn't really matter what you call this page. This is just a page that we're gonna create in our application. So essentially inside of here, in our customer facing section, we would create a folder called Stripe. And inside of here, we would have a purchase success and a page.tsx inside of there. And I need to make sure that I actually create a page.tsx file instead of folder. So let's make sure that we actually delete that folder. And then we'll come in here and we'll create a brand new file called page.tsx, export default function success page and we'll just return an h1 that says hi there we go now we can minimize that down this is just where we're going to get redirected after we make that purchase now if this purchase was successful stripe is automatically going to redirect us to that page and none of our other code will run but if it's unsuccessful it'll call this dot then method and it'll pass along an error just like this we can actually use that error to determine what the error is and render it out to the user. So we'll come in here and we'll say that we have that error. And in the case that we have an error, what we want to do is we want to check the error type. If the error type is equal to either a card error or the error dot type is equal to a validation error. Well, this means that it's an error message that we can safely show to the user and it'll make sense. So we'll say set error message and we'll send the error dot message. Otherwise, in all other cases, this error message is more of like jargon for developers. So we should just give them a generic error message. So we'll say set error message, and it just says an unknown error occurred. Just like that, there we go. So now let's create some state for that up here. Error message, set error message. And by default, we'll just have this be empty and it's gonna be a string. Then the very last thing I wanna do, no matter what, if we get to this point, I wanna set my is loading to false. There we go. That way it'll actually let us resubmit the form. So now if we have an error, it'll actually show up for us inside of this section. All we need to do is render out the error message. So down here, we'll say error message, just like that. If we have an error message, I'm gonna render out the error message, just like that. And I think I accidentally imported something up here. There we go, make sure I remove that. Now we give that a quick save. Make sure that everything is hooked up properly. It looks like we're missing something. That's because this should be on this line right there. There we go. That cleaned up everything. And now if we try to purchase this, you'll notice we get our error message at the top here, as well as error messages on all of these fields. So that's exactly what we want. 
Now, the next thing is we need to make sure we get the email of the user as well. And luckily Stripe has a way to do this pretty much automatically. And that's with this link authentication element. If we add in this link authentication element and do nothing else, you'll notice at the very bottom, we get an email field being added in. Now, all I want to do is just add a little bit of spacing. So I'm gonna come in here, the div, which has a margin on the top of four. I'm gonna put my element inside of that just to space it out from the top section here. And again, if I move my camera, you can see that this looks really good where we have our email at the bottom, the purchase button. And if we have anything missing, you can see it's gonna force us to fill in all of that information. Now I can just move my camera back since we've seen all we need to see. And now what I wanna do before we finish up the Stripe integration is make sure that we do this check right here for existing users or existing orders. And to do that, we need to make sure we get their email address because that's how we actually link together a user. So we'll say email set email is equal to use state. This is gonna be a string. And by default, it's gonna start out empty. And if I come down here on my link, this actually has an on change event listener we can listen to. And we can come in here and we can say set email. This is gonna be e dot. And what we wanna do is we wanna get the value dot email. So that's going to give us the actual email. So every single time we type inside of here, it's going to put that email directly inside of this section. So now we have access to that email. So if up here, our email is equal to null. Obviously we cannot submit our form, but now if we have an email, we can actually check to get a user's order. So we're gonna call an action, which is just gonna be user order exists. We're gonna pass it in the email and the ID of the product that we wanna check. So make sure we get that product ID up here, just like that. And we'll pass in the type for that as well, which is going to be a string. And we'll pass that into here is equal to product.id, there we go. So now we're gonna make this action because essentially this action will return to us a Boolean. We'll say order exist equals, we're just gonna await for this, make sure that this is an async function, just like that. So if our order exists, well, obviously that's a problem. So we should set some type of error message. So I'm gonna say that you have already purchased this product. Try downloading it from, whoops, it from the my orders page. There we go. And we'll come in here, we'll set is loading to false, and then we'll just return because we don't actually want to submit our form. We don't wanna make a purchase if they've already purchased the product. So now let's go ahead and actually create this action. So we'll copy the name of that. We'll come over here inside of our app. We'll create a brand new folder called actions. And inside this actions folder, we'll create one called orders.ts for all of our order related actions. So first of all, this must have use server at the top of it. And then we'll export a function. It's gonna be an async function with that specific name. And it takes in an email, which is a string. And it's going to take in our product ID, which is a string. And all we need to do is just check for this order. So we can say DB, make sure I import DB. We wanna get an order and we wanna find the first one that essentially has these fields. So where the user email is equal to our email and where the product ID is equal to our product ID. So we can await this. And this will actually give us an order just like that. And all we wanna do is make sure this is not equal to null. So really we can just return checking to make sure this is not equal to null. So we'll just wrap these in parentheses is not equal to null, just like that. And what I'm gonna do is down here, we're just gonna say select, whoops, there we go. Select, make sure I put that inside the correct parentheses, select. We're just gonna set that to true, just like that. And actually, instead of setting it to true, I'm gonna say that our ID is gonna be true. So all we're gonna do is select one field. This just saves us from selecting more data than we actually need, because all we're checking to see is if this thing actually exists. So this really simple function is just gonna check, is there an order for that email and that product? If so, the customer has obviously already purchased this product. So now we can just come in here, import this function, and that should be all we need to do for this page to work. As you can see, if we look through here, we have one error right here where our product ID, and that's just because we need to specify the type of this ID at the top here. So now that's everything that we need for this entire page to be working. So let's go ahead and test to see if this actually makes a purchase. To do this, we can set a card number, and in our case, it's going to be 42 repeated a bunch of times. Then you can put any expiration, CVC, and zip code, as long as it's in the future. And then we're just gonna put a random email inside of here, it doesn't matter. And now we're gonna click the purchase button. You can see it's loading and it looks like it didn't actually redirect us. So something went wrong. As you can see, an unknown error occurred. Now, just to make sure this wasn't a fluke, what I'm gonna actually do is completely refresh my page just to make sure there's no weird caching stuff going on. And I'm gonna enter in my card number, expiration, all that information and just a random email address to see if that error still persists because it could have just been some weird caching stuff, but it looks like we still have that error. So if we look through our code, I believe the problem is, is that we don't have this next public server URL specified yet. So our return URL is broken, which is causing this error. So let's go ahead and add that into our environment variables. Come in here, next public server URL. This is localhost 
3000, just like that. Make sure we add the HTTP. There we go. So that is going to be the correct URL for our site. So now hopefully this should work. I'm gonna make sure I restart my server just because I changed my ENV variable just to make sure there's nothing weird going on. We'll completely refresh this page and we'll test this out to make sure that this is actually working properly. So we'll enter in all of this information again, random email address, doesn't matter what it is. Click on the purchase button and hopefully this time it should redirect us to that page and it looks like it did and you can see in the top we have payment intent and other information inside of our url which we can use to make sure that this was actually a successful purchase because there could be some type of error still even with everything going through so on this page i essentially want to show the exact same section that i showed up here so i'm going to scroll all the way up to where we have all this stuff for our actual card essentially for our at the top product section. I'm gonna just copy that because we're gonna make it look very similar on this page. I'm gonna go to that Stripe purchase success. I'm gonna come into here and this is where I actually want to render that information. So I'm just gonna paste it down. Obviously we don't need our form though, so we can remove that section here. Let's make sure we import our image that we have. And we also need to import this format currency function as well. There we go. Now all we need to do is get our product as well as get all the information from our search params. So this has a search params just like this, search params. And we can type out this search params, params. This is going to have a payment intent, which is a string. And this is essentially the ID for our payment intent. And we can use that with Stripe to actually get the thing that we want to check to see if it was successful or not. So we need to load Stripe at the top of this page, just like we have done before. So if we go over to the page where we were doing that, which was our purchase page, you'll notice we loaded Stripe at the top here. I'm just gonna copy that code because we're doing essentially the exact same thing. Now let's go back to our purchase success page. And we're going to load Stripe at the very top and make sure that we import Stripe from Stripe. There we go. So now we're loading our Stripe and we can use that inside of here. So I can just say await Stripe dot and I want to get my payment intent. So we'll say payment intents dot retrieve. I'm going to retrieve it based on my search params dot payment intent ID. So now this is going to give me a payment intent. And this payment intent is going to have information about success and not success. And it's also going to have information about my actual product code itself that's inside of our metadata. So we can come into here. We can say if payment intent dot metadata dot product ID is equal to null, we'll return not found because that means for some reason this didn't have an actual product ID associated with it. So if that's a problem. We should return something with that. And we're also going to come in here with our product. Whoops product and we're actually going to get that from our database so that's await db dot product dot find unique and we're going to get it where our id is our payment intent dot metadata dot product id just like that and we're going to do the exact same thing here if for some reason our product is null that means our id was incorrect so if our product equals null, we're again going to return not found. Now here's where we can determine success versus error. So we can say const is success is equal to, we can get our payment intent dot status, whoops, status. And if that is equal to succeeded, well that means it was actually a successful payment intent and we can render out the success message and we can render out all the other information related to that. Otherwise we can throw an error essentially. So here inside of this information, we also want to add an H1 at the top of this to specify whether this is a success or not. So if it is a success, we can just say success, put an exclamation point, make it really happy. There we go. Otherwise we can say error, close that off, add some classes. So this looks a little bit better. So we'll say class name, we'll have four XL for our font size and we'll make it bold. So it's very large. So now you can see success in big letters because this actually did work. The last thing I want to do is add a button that allows us to actually download this file because once they purchase it, they probably want to download the file and they may not want to go to their email to do that. So here, let's add a class name, margin top of four to give it some space. Size is going to be large on this button and we're going to make sure that this button is a link. So we're going to use as child. Now here, we only want to show this actual link to be for if you have a success, you can download. Otherwise you need a link that just essentially says try again because you had a failure. So here, we're going to have is success. And then what we're going to do is if it is successful, we're going to render out an anchor tag that goes to the download. Otherwise, we're going to render a link that goes back to our page. So link, this is going to be an href back to the purchase page. So let's make sure we get this correct. This will be slash products slash product dot ID slash we want to go to the purchase link. There we go. Close off that link tag. And here it'll say try again. There we go. So now if we have a failure, our button will render out this link. 
So we can just come in here, we can manually set this to false to show you what that'll look like. So if this is set to false, make sure I spelled that properly. You can see this says try again. Obviously I spelled again wrong, so let's fix that. And if I click on this link, you can see it's bringing me back to the purchase page. Now, obviously this was successful, so let's get this back to a success. Make sure I spell this correctly again. And now let's work on this link right here. This link is gonna be a little bit different because we need a way to download a file. And when we are on the admin page, we could just download the file no matter what, because we were signed in as an admin. But in this case, we want to send them a link that is valid for either like 10 minutes, an hour, 24 hours, whatever it is. We want to create a verification link that says, hey, you are able to download this for a set period of time. That way you can't share the link and give it to other people for free. So I'm essentially going to create a brand new route inside of our products folder. We're going to create a brand new folder inside of here called download. And this is going to have essentially a download link ID, or I think we call it verification. So verification ID, just like that. So this is going to have a route inside of here, route.ts, just like that. And for now, we'll just export function get, and we'll return, just doesn't matter, we'll just say hi. Obviously this won't work, but it's just going to be a placeholder for now. So now what we wanna do is we wanna essentially create a new verification link so we can send them to that location. So on our href here, we wanna send them to that slash products slash download, and we want to get the ID inside of here. We need to create some type of ID. So to do that, we can create a download verification, just like that. And this is going to be for our specific product. So let's create a function for that. Create download verification, which takes in a product ID, which is a string, just like that. So here we can return db, we want to get our download verifications. We want to create a brand new one inside of here, and we're going to pass in some data. This data is going to be rather straightforward. We need the product ID, and we need to have an expires at field. And this expires at is essentially going to be a date that is in the future. So this is really easy to write. We can say we want to create a new date. And for this new date, we want to take whatever the current date time is. We want to add in 1000 times 60 times 60 times 24. Essentially, this right here is the number of milliseconds in one day. So right here, we've just created a brand new download verification that expires 24 hours from now for this particular product ID. Now, if we scroll up here, we can just make sure that we await this finishing and this will return to us this download verification ID. All we want in our case is the ID. So here we can just add in and await and we can wrap this and we'll get just the ID from this. Make sure that this is an async function just like that. So now every single time we go to this page, it's going to create to us a brand new download link that will last for 24 hours that links to this particular location for this particular product ID. And we can make this button just say download. So now you can see we have this download button. And when I click to go to this page, I'm obviously going to get an error just because my code for my page doesn't do anything correctly. But if I were to go to here and I return a new next response, just like that, and this next response will just say hi. Now, hopefully that should work. And as you can see, I get the text hi being printed out. Now, obviously we want to download the file here only if it's actually within that window. So that's going to be the next thing that we're gonna work on before we actually verify the purchase using Stripe. So the first thing we need to do is get our parameters. So we have our request, which is just a next request. And we're also going to have our params inside of here. So params is going to have a download verification ID. And let's actually type this out, params which is download verification ID. That is a string, just like that. Looks like I didn't quite type this out properly. Move this out one level deeper. There we go. That's all of our typing done. So now we can actually get that download verification. So the very first thing I wanna do is get our db.downloadverification.find unique based on where the ID is our download verification ID. There we go. Make sure we await that. And we can also make this an async function. Now that'll just get us that download verification, but we also only want to get the download verification where the expiration date is also after a certain time. So we can come in here and we can say expires at needs to be greater than, and we wanna set this to a new date. So essentially we're saying the expires at is after the current time that we are currently at. That'll make sure we only get a download verification if it's not expired. The next thing we can do is select all the fields that we need because really we, all we care about is the product. So inside of our product, let's select the file path and the name because those are the only things that we need to actually download this particular file. There we go. Now from there, what we can do is we can say if our data is equal to null, then we can just return a brand new response because essentially we either had an expired code or we have a code that is no longer in our database at all. So in both cases, we cannot download this. So we'll return a new next response and this is actually going to redirect us to a page. So we'll say next 
response.redirect. We're essentially going to redirect them to a page that says their code is expired. So we'll create a brand new URL. And this URL is going to go to slash products slash download slash expired. There we go. And then we can also just make sure that we pass in the URL that we want to use inside of this new URL. So let me make sure this is right there. There we go. Essentially, that's just going to create a brand new URL using our current localhost 3000, and it's going to redirect them to that exact location. Now, if we don't have a problem, that means that we can download the file. So we're just going to copy that code essentially directly from our admin page, because it's going to be pretty much identical. So inside of our admin pages, let's open that up. We have our products, we have our ID, download, and I just want to copy this entire section down here for downloading our product. So what we can do is we can come into here, right after this section, we can just paste all of this down, make sure that we import FS. So I want to come up here, import FS from FS slash promises, just like that. And then we obviously need to get our product from our data. So we can say data dot product dot file path, J same thing here, same thing here, and same thing there. Perfect. So now hopefully if I go ahead and refresh this page, it should actually download this file. And as you can see, it's actually giving me that file and it's giving me the download link for it and I could download it if I want. But if for some reason my code was expired or I type in an incorrect code in my URL, when I do that, it's going to redirect me to this expired page. So let's go ahead and just really quickly create that expired page. So it's going to be expired slash page dot TSX export default function expired. And instead of making you watch me type this out, I'll just paste in the code for this It's relatively straightforward. Essentially, all I'm doing once I import these imports, I'll explain it is essentially I have an H1 that just says, hey, your download link expired and a button that brings you back to getting a new link from that my orders page. So if I refresh this page, you can see download link expired, get new link and it's going to redirect us to the orders page, which we have not created, but it's just this page right here. So that's working perfectly fine, just like we expect it to. Now, throughout this entire process, there may be one thing that you notice that we haven't actually done yet, and that is creating a customer and creating an order for them. And that's because we don't want to do that on our success page. Instead, what we want to do is we want to wait for a webhook from Stripe because Stripe will actually send you a webhook when a payment is successful. And that is when we want to make sure that we actually create all this information. So to do that, I'm gonna create a brand new section inside of our app folder. We're gonna come in here. I'm gonna create a brand new folder this folder is going to be called webhooks. I'm going to create a folder specifically for any webhooks related to Stripe. And inside of here, I'm going to have a route.ts. So this is going to be called by Stripe when we have a successful payment. And the reason you want to use this webhook instead of your order success page is it's going to be more secure because it's only ever going to get called when there was a successful payment. It's going to come directly from Stripe and there's different verification set up so you can authenticate that this is the correct page. Now, in order to test these webhooks, if we go over to the Stripe documentation, this handle post payment events talks all about how we can use a webhook to set this up. And if we go to the dashboard webhook tool, it'll actually give us a dashboard where we can set up and use our webhooks. If I move my camera out of the way, it's a little easier for you to see. You can see there's a button for testing in local. And what we can do is essentially download the Stripe CLI. I'll zoom this in a little bit so it's easier to see. Download the Stripe URL. We can listen on whatever local host we want. And we can also trigger any different payment successes and so on if we want to. So to do this, I've already set up Stripe login. I'm already logged in on my PC. All I need to do is just type in this exact command. So if I open up a brand new terminal and I paste in this command, give it a quick second to load. There we go. And we want to make sure that we're forwarding to this local host. 3000 slash and ours is called webhooks slash stripe. Now, if we give that an enter right here, what it's going to do is redirect every single webhook that we have from stripe to our local host. And you can see it's given us this webhook secret, which we want to save inside of our environment variables. So we're going to come in here. And this is going to be our stripe webhook secret. And the really nice thing about this with local testing is if I zoom out a little more, you'll actually see it gives me a bunch of code over here on the right on what I can do. And you'll also see I get this received events section. This will actually show me every single event that is received so I can really look through the data that's happening. And if I wanted to, I could trigger a specific request if I really wanted. But in our case, I don't want to worry about that. Instead, I'm just going to test these manually because I have metadata and that metadata will not show up in these manually triggered events. I want to be able to test it inside of my actual application. So now that we have that set up, I'm going to zoom this back in so it's a little easier to see. I'm going to actually make this a bit smaller and we're going to come over to our application because I want to really focus on the actual setup of this. So here we need to create a post event. So async function post request is going to be a next request just like that. There we go. And this is going to be what's called by Stripe. And it's going to give us essentially a bunch of information that's going to be coming from the body. So what we can do is we can say Stripe, which we of course need to create. So we'll import Stripe from Stripe, just like that. And then what we can do after that is we can say const Stripe 
is equal to creating a new stripe. We need to make sure we pass it in our secret key. So stripe secret key as a string. There we go. So now we can say stripe dot and we can access a bunch of things. We specifically want to access the webhooks and we want to construct an event from our webhook. This will essentially verify that all the stuff being passed to this is actually coming from Stripe. That's why we have that secret key because it's going to make sure everything is working fine. So first what we want to do is we want to take our request dot text and we want to send that along to our event just like this. The second thing that we want to do is we want to take our headers and we want to get the specific header of Stripe dash signature signature there we go this is going to be used to compare against our actual webhook so here our process dot env dot webhook secret our stripe one this is what's going to be compared against this right here so i'm going to make sure that this is a string just like that by saying as string and i'm going to do the same thing here i'm just going to cast this to a string so that'll all work instead of our typing and now this will give us an event or it'll throw an error if for some reason that the Stripe header does not match our secret. For example, if someone tried to maliciously target this endpoint by creating their own events to try to get something for free, this will throw an error so that will not work. Now I want to determine what type of event I'm listening to. As you can see, there are tons of different events you can listen to. In our case, we want to care about charge succeeded. So anytime we had a successful charge on our account, it's going to call this right here. And what we can do is we get all the information from here. For example, our charge is just our event.data.object. And this contains a bunch of different fields inside of it, such as our amount. It's going to contain our customer billing information, like their email, as well as our metadata for our product ID. So I can get my product ID by getting my charge.metadata.productID. I can then get the email, which is my charge.billing details. There we go, dot email. That's going to be coming from that link component that we just created. And then we have our price paid in cents. And that's just our charge dot amount. So this is all the information that we need to create an order for a customer. And we already know that this is verified by Stripe because of this code right here. So what we can do is we can actually create that order. But first, we want to make sure that our product exists. So we're going to get our product by waiting db dot product. Make sure I import db. There we go. And I want to find essentially the first one, the unique one, where my ID is my product ID. There we go. So this is going to get a product. And if our product is equal to null or our email is equal to null, then we have some type of problem. So we're essentially going to return a status that says that this is bad. So we'll return a new next response. There we go. And this next response is going to say bad request. Doesn't really matter what it says but we're going to make sure our status is going to be a 400 status to let them know this was not what we expected. There we go. And now we can actually go ahead and create the specific information that we want. So essentially all I want to do is create a user or update the user by adding an order to them. And this is actually something we could do really easily with Prisma. So we can say db.user. And what I want to do is an upsert. And what this will do is it'll either update my user or it'll insert a brand new user. So we need to make sure we pass it information for both what we want to do in the creation process as well as what we want to do in the update process. And these are both going to be the exact same fields. So I'll write them out and then we'll just make sure we put them in a variable so it's easier to work with. So in our case, we want to specify the email for our user and we want to specify the orders. And we want to create a brand new order and that order is going to have a product ID and a price paid in cents, just like that. So this is all I want to do when I create a user and I want to do the same thing when I update. So I'm just going to copy this, say const user fields is equal to this right here. And I'm going to pass that along to both the create and the update. So now what's essentially happening is I'm creating a brand new user with this email and I'm creating a brand new order for them. But if the user already exists in our database, instead, it'll set their email to this email, which is fine because it's already their email and it'll add a brand new order for them. So it'll both do the creating and the updating all in one. All we need to do is specify a where field here in the case of update. So we're going to say where our email is email. So what's going to happen is if our email exists in our database, it's going to add a brand new order for that user. If the email does not exist, it'll create a brand new user with that email and also add that order to them. Now we can also specify what we want to select from here. In our case, I just want to get the order that we created. So I'm going to get my orders. I'm going to order them by the created at just like that. And I'm going to get them in the descending order. And of course, I just want to take one single order from here. So from here, I can get my orders and I can get the very first order just like that. 
And if I await this, I essentially have gotten whatever order I created right here inside this order variable. Now, if I just stopped right here, this would actually create the connection between user and order and product, which is great, but I also wanna send them an email, essentially a receipt saying that they made this purchase as well as a download link inside of that. So I need to set up the information for that as well. So what we can do is we can create a download verification. This is going to be the download link they can use in their email. And that's just awaiting db.download verification. We wanna create a brand new one where our data is essentially our product ID and the expires that is going to be that new date. And we're gonna say date.now. And this will be again, 24 hours from now. So 1000 times 60 times 60 times 24. And if you wanted to make these longer or shorter verification expirations, we could easily do that. And this will say product ID. So now we have our download verification, we have our order, that's all the information we need to send them an email. Now to actually do this email sending, I'm gonna be using a service called Resend. You can use any service you want, there's tons of them. I mean, there's Mailgun, there's things like Send in Blue. there's Twilio, it doesn't really matter, but I find that Resend works really well. It's pretty simple to work with. So this is what we're gonna be using to send out all of our different emails. As you can see, I've already done some test emails throughout here, so it's relatively simple to get set up. Just create an account, they have a really generous free tier. That's what I'm using for this entire project. Now, the first thing we need to do is actually get our API key that we're gonna be using inside of here. So let's just make sure that we get our key. To get that, I can just come in here, edit API key. As you can see, I can't actually copy this API key, so I should probably just create a brand new one. So we'll just create an API key. This will be test video, just like that. It's gonna be full access, doesn't really matter. And you can see we can copy this because we can only see this key one time. So we're gonna copy over that API key and we're gonna put that inside of our env variable. This is gonna be private. So we'll send resend API key. There we go paste that down just like that. And again, you're gonna to need to get your own API key because I'm gonna be deleting this at the end of the video. Now, if you're doing this for real, you should probably restrict the permissions to things like sending access only, but in our case, it doesn't matter. This is just for testing purposes. So now let's go back to where we just were. This is where we're ready to send our email and we need to send essentially resend emails through here. So if we look over the documentation for getting started, that'll tell us what to do, or I can just show you what to do. We're gonna create a brand new resend object which is going to be coming from this resend library that we need to install. So to do that, we're gonna come in here, we're gonna add a brand new tab, we're gonna say npm i resend, and we're also going to install React email, just like this. This allows us to write emails using React code. It's a really easy way to make sure our emails work across all different browsers, all different email providers, because writing HTML emails sucks, and this React email library makes it a little bit easier, and it's actually made by the same team as resend, so you know that it'll work really well with resend. So now that we have this, we can import resend from resend, just like that. And this import should actually be in brackets, just like that. And now I can pass it along my env variable, process.env.resend API key as a string. There we go. Now we have access to resend. We can come all the way down here and use that to send an email. And the nice thing is it's really easy to send. We can just say resend.emails. Dot send, and now we can specify what the email will look like. For example, we can specify the from field, we can specify the to field, which is just the email that we've got. We can specify the subject, which is just gonna be order confirmation. And we can specify what we want this to look like inside of React. So I'm just gonna put an H1 that just says hi, H1 just like that. And I'm gonna make sure that this is a TSX, that way I can actually render out my React JSX inside of here. So now all we need to do is specify a from, I'm just gonna say that this is a support email. So the name is gonna be support and the actual email is gonna come from our ENV variable. We'll say sender email, just like that. Make sure I put a comma at the end of here. That's all we need to do to be able to send emails. Now for testing purposes, resend has a really nice email we can use. So we can say sender email is going to be onboarding at resend.dev and it allows us to send our emails with this testing purposes. So now we can close out of all of that and we essentially have a test email that we can send along. All we need to do is make sure that we await this and then we can come all the way down here and we can make sure that we return a new next response, just like that. And we'll put this at the very bottom. So no matter what happens, it'll at least send a successful response as long as all of our code works fine. Now we're gonna come through and make the email look really good in a little bit. Right now, obviously it's super ugly because all it says is hi, but this is just gonna be for testing purposes to make sure everything is hooked up together. So now we can come over here and let's create a brand new purchase. We're gonna come in here, we're gonna purchase final product too. I'll expand this a little bit. And we'll come in here with our test card number. We want our expiration, CVC, and so on. But when it comes to email, if you're using resend, you need to type in the email that you actually created your account for if you're using this for testing purposes. So I'm gonna type in the email that I actually use to create my account. Otherwise, it won't let you send emails anywhere else. So now if I click purchase on this, it should hopefully work everything fine. As you can see, the download link worked. If we come over here, you can see it's actually sending along my webhooks and I got 200 responses. 
If I look in my developer tools for my webhooks, zoom this out, you'll notice in my received events, you can see we get all the information for our events that we received inside of our webhooks, which is working really well. And we should actually see if we go to our admin pages that we now have a user that was created. So I'll say admin, just like that. I'm probably gonna need to log in. Actually, it's saved for me. So now we can go over to our products. You can see we have our products. We go to our customers. You can see, of course, we haven't created this page yet, but we should see we have a customer in here and we have an order in here. And if I open up my email, you can see I just got sent an email one minute ago that says, hi, onboarding at resend.dev, and it was sent to my email. So I know that this is also working, which is really great. So we can close out of that. We have everything working. All we need to do is set up these admin pages. That way we can make sure that our pages are actually working for creating users and creating orders. And then we'll go ahead and make these emails look a lot better as well as sending along an email order history as well. So let's go ahead and make this a little bit wider, easier to work with. And what I wanna do is go to my admin section and I wanna create a new folder for my users. And I wanna create a new folder for my orders as well. So we'll get started with users first page.tsx. And I'm actually just going to copy this code in. I'll go through exactly what it's doing line by line, but it's pretty much identical to the actual product section. As you can see here, we have a function for getting all of our different users. And we're just selecting all the things that we need, such as the price that they paid in cents. Then we're rendering out a header that says customers, and we're rendering out our user table. If we have no users, we just said no customers were found. Then we're listing out the email, the orders, as well as what the value is for all these different orders. As you can see, we're getting all of our different orders for the individual user. And what we can do down here is we list out the email, we list out the number of orders, and we're just adding together the total amount that they've paid, and we're dividing that by 100 to get the actual amount that they have paid in total. Finally, we have this drop down menu section, which has one action for deleting a user. So we need to create this delete drop down item. So I can come into here, create a brand new folder called underscore components. And inside of here, I'll create a file for those user actions. So this will just say user actions.tsx. Again, this should be very similar because this is exactly what we did for our products. I'm just going to copy this over again and I'll explain exactly what's going on. But it's, again, this should look familiar because it's exactly the same. As you can see, we have our transition, we have our router. Whenever we click the button, we call delete user and then we refresh our page. All we need to do is create the action for deleting a user. So we'll do that inside of our actions folder here users.ts. And again, I'm just going to copy this code over because it's exactly the same as the code that we had for our products section instead. So now if I give these all a quick save, you can see over on the right hand side that we have all this information. And just to show you what this is, we're just getting our user calling delete. And if it's null, we return not found. Otherwise, we return the user. So as you can see, we have my information for my user, their orders and the value for all their orders in total. Now we can go ahead and work on the sales section as well to show you what the actual sales were going to look like. So that's again going to be very similar to what we've already done. I'll create a new file called orders.ts because we're going to have our delete function inside of here. And inside of our orders, we're going to have a page.tsx and we're going to have the exact same underscore components. And that's because this is going to look almost identical. So let me make sure I create that as a folder. And inside that folder, I'll create our order actions.tsx. And again, it's going to be identical essentially to this page, but for our orders instead. So let's go to that brand new orders page that we just created. I'll paste in the code. Again, I'll go through it line by line. As you can see, we're selecting all of our different orders, ordering them in the correct order. We're then listing out the header of sales. And as you can see here, we're just listing the product, the customer, and the price paid. We're listing out that information down here. And then finally, we have our delete action right here. So let's copy over that delete action code. We'll just paste that into here. This again should look pretty much identical to code we've done before because as you can see, it's exactly the same. We just swapped out order for user and so on. Then finally, up here inside of our actions, we have our user section. So I'm gonna copy over the code for deleting our user, or not our user, our order, sorry. So let's copy over that order code real quick. Paste that in here. As you can see, again, identical to what we did for the user, pretty much line for line. We just replaced user with order. So now if we go over to that sales page, you can see we have our sales as well as what product they bought, the customer that bought it, and the price that they actually paid for that product. And we have the option to delete both of these if we really wanted to. But in our case, we're just going to leave them as is, which is perfectly fine. Now, I'm also going to test to see if this works if we purchase multiple products with the same person. So I'm going to come over here, go over to my products, and I'm going to attempt to purchase this product as well. So I'm going to use the exact same card number. That's our testing card number. Get all the other information we need. Type in the email. There we go. And I'm going to click purchase and we should see that this purchase will go through as well. As you can see, that looked like it was successful. And now I'm going to try to purchase a product that I already own. I already own this product. So I'm going to come in here, just put a bunch of bogus information and I'll try to enter my email address. And we should get a warning saying that I cannot purchase this product. So Kyle at WebDoSimplified.com purchase. You've already purchased this project. Try downloading it from the My Orders page up here. 
And best of all, if we go to the admin page, we should see that there are now multiple orders for this one individual product or for this one customer. So if we go to our customer, you can see that they have two orders for a total value of 1,200. And you can see both of these different orders right here. Obviously, you could make these admin pages more complex and more useful, but for our use case, this is about all we really need to get started with. So now we can move on to the main section of getting our email done, because that's kind of the last final step before we have our product done. So if we go back to our local host 3000, we want to get an email that we sent them for a purchase, as well as an email for this My Orders page that we haven't created yet. So I'm just going to minimize this down a little bit, and we're going to start working on that section next. So we're going to kind of minimize all of this section because the nice thing about using React email is we can actually create our emails using React normal JSX. So inside the source here, I'm going to create a brand new folder called email, which is where I'm going to put all of my different emails. For example, we're going to have an email for purchase receipt. There we go, .tsx. I'm going to do the exact same thing for order history .tsx as well. And I'm going to go ahead and create an underscore components folder just to store a component because we're going to actually use that component inside of here. And this component, we're going to just call order information .tsx because we're going to show the same order information in both of these sections. And we'll just call this normal components because it's not in our app directory. So we don't need to start this with an underscore. Now, in order to test emails efficiently, you don't really want to be sending yourself emails constantly. It's super slow, not super efficient. So instead, the nice thing about React email is they have a way you can easily test emails. We're going to create a brand new, essentially, script called email that allows us to start up a server that allows us to view our emails as if they were working inside of like Gmail and so on. So to get React email to actually work, all we need to do is type in email dev, and we need to specify the directory where our emails are, which in our case is source slash email. That's where we're storing all of our emails. And we need to specify a port, which in our case is 3001. If I run that, that'll get up and started with my email server. Now, one problem with this, though, is that it won't copy over our environment variables. And inside of our environment variables, we have things like our server URL, which we need to be able to access to send our emails. So to make sure that this copies over our environment variables for testing purposes, we can type in cp.env. That'll copy our env file. And we want to copy that to node modules slash react email. And then we can just put double ampersand here. And essentially what this code is doing is taking our environment variables and copying them over to the location where that this code actually runs. And that means we'll have access to those environment variables inside of this testing environment. I'll show you exactly what this looks like. If we open up a new tab, we can run npm run email. And that's going to open up a new server for us at port 3001. After we give it a second, if we open that up, you can see it's running over here. And by copying over these env variables we just make sure that we have access to them only in development mode so as you can see we now have this working obviously we have nothing inside of our folder being rendered so we need to go ahead and work on that next let's do our purchase receipt we need to export a function but to make it work with development we need this to be a default function so we're going to call this purchase receipt just like that now i'm just going to go ahead and bring my camera back because it shouldn't get in the way of anything up to this point so now for this purchase receipt, all we want to do is render this out as an email. So we'll say purchase receipt email to make it a little bit more clear. And here, all I want to do is return all the stuff we need. And this is all going to be coming from that React email library. So we need to first get the HTML element, which comes from React email. So let's make sure we close that off. Up here, we want to import HTML from React email, just like that. And actually, we need to get this from a specific library called React email components. So I want to say npm i at React email slash components, that'll give us all the different components we need. So if we change this to be slash components, you'll now see that that is actually working, we can close out of that. And now inside of here, we need to specify everything else we need. So first, we can specify what the preview text is going to look like. And for that preview text, we can just come in here and it'll say download, whoops, download, and we want to put whatever the product dot name is. There we go. And view receipt. There we go. And we're going to get our product from up here. So we'll just specify our product just like that. That's going to be our preview, which we can import. Then since we want to use Tailwind, we can just specify Tailwind just like this. And it's going to make sure we can use Tailwind directly inside of our email. And we can also specify the body element that we're going to be using. So we'll say body just like that. And we need to specify that we're going to have a head element. And again, this must come from React email. So make sure we get our head element from React email components just like that. So now we have everything we need to be able to style out what we want. So for example, on our body, let's set the font to sans. 
and the background color to white, just like that. We can also specify here that we want our receipt to be spelled correctly. Now, one thing to note about Tailwind is you will need to pass in your own custom configuration. It won't use your normal Tailwind config because not everything will work. For our case, I don't really care about passing in a custom config because these emails don't have to be perfect. They just have to be good enough. Now inside of our body, let's specify the container that we want to use from React email. And this kind of wraps your entire email body. And for this, we're gonna specify a max width. So we're gonna say max W is going to be extra large. Then inside of here, we can specify we're going to have a heading. And this is again, going to make sure it comes from React email. And this will say purchase receipt, just like that. And then finally, we want to have all of our order information. So we'll say order information. And that's that component we're going to share between all of our different things. So make sure I get that order information component directly from here. So I'm going to say export function order information, just like that. Give that a quick save. And now we'll make sure that we import that right here. So now if I give that a save, you'll see that right now it's not is giving errors just because that's returning void. Let's come into here. We'll just return something for now. It says hi. There we go. Just so that is working. You can see now our only error is based on our props. So we can say that type purchase email or purchase receipt email props is equal to, and we're going to have a product. And that product is going to have a name, which is a string. Obviously, we're going to add much more later, but that'll work for now. So purchase receipt email props. There we go. So now if we give this page a refresh, you should see that it should actually show our emails. If we look over here, you can click purchase receipt to view that actual email. But of course, we're getting an error because there is no prop being passed in. So to fix this, what we can do is we can take our thing, purchase receipt email dot, and we can specify the preview props. And we can specify this as an object. So for example, we can say that we want to have a product where the name is going to be product name, just like that. And we can say that this will satisfy our purchase receipt email props. So it makes sure that it actually fits within this type. So now if I open this up and give this a quick refresh, it should actually show our purchase receipt. And as you can see, it says purchase receipt, hi. We can test it on different screen sizes. We can see the code behind the scenes. It just gives us all the information we need. We can even directly send it to ourselves if we really want. Now let's move on and actually get our order information to work properly because obviously we want to make this the most important section. And here we want to have an order, a product, and a download verification ID. So we can come in here and make sure we specify our order information props. So our type order information props, we're going to have our order just like that. Doesn't matter what it is for now, our product and our download verification ID, which is a string. So now let's write out what this email will look like, and then we'll fill in the rest of our props in a second. So inside of here, we're going to have a section. And this again is coming from React email. Essentially, you want to use React email for everything in your email to make sure it renders properly because it uses things like tables and so on, which work really well in emails. Now we want to specify a row. So we'll come in here with a row again coming from React email. And inside that row, obviously, we're going to have some columns coming directly from React email. So this first column is going to be for specifying our order ID, purchased on, price paid, and so on. So we're going to come in here with some text. And this text is going to say order ID. And then below that, we're going to have some text as well, just like that. Again, make sure we get that from the correct import. And this one is going to be our order.id. So inside of our order up here, we're going to have an ID, which is a string. There we go. And let's add some classes to this so it looks relatively good. We're going to put no margin on the bottom of this. We're going to have the text gray 500, so it's kind of a muted color. White space, no wrap, so there's no wrapping that goes on. We'll say text no wrap as well. And then finally, we'll add some margin on the right of four. Then what we're going to do inside of here for this next one is add some styling as well. Margin on the top of zero, so they're scrunched together. And margin on the right of four to space them out from one another. Now I'm going to copy this column down two more times because on top of our order ID, we're also going to have the date we purchased this. So purchased on, and we're also going to have the price paid. So we're going to say price paid just like that. So for our purchased on, we need to get that from our order dot created at, and we want to format this using some date formatter. So we'll say date formatter dot format, and we'll pass along that information. And up here, we can create that date formatter. So we'll say const date formatter equals new intl, whoops, intl dot date time formatter. We want this to be using English, and we're going to say that the date style 
is going to be of medium length. That's going to look really well for us inside of our email. So now we have that formatted. And here we can format our currency currency of our actual price paid, which is order dot price paid in cents divided by 100. There we go. So let's get up here, add in those props. So we're going to have created at that's a date. And we're going to have price paid in cents, which is a number. Give that a quick save. There's all that information. Make sure I spell everything correctly. This should say created at. There we go. That looks good. And now we have all that information. And if I give this a refresh, we should see that at the top of our email. But of course, we need to make sure all of our props are being passed into everything correctly. So what we can do is we can go back over to our purchase receipt because our purchase receipt also needs to get in our order. And our order should essentially contain all that same information. So what we can do is come over to here and we can copy over what this order looks like and we can paste that down directly into here. This is going to be our order. There we go. And then we can make sure we pass an order into here as well. So the ID is just going to give it a random ID. We'll get a random UUID just like that. We have the created at. This is going to be just the current time. Doesn't really matter. And for the price paid in cents, let's just say that it's going to be $100. There we go. Now we give that a quick save. Make sure I pass along our order into here, which is our order, and our product, which is our product. And we need to pass along our download verification ID, which is download verification ID. That's going to come in from our props as well. So let's add that up to here as a string, and we'll add that into here as a random UUID. So crypto.random UUID. There we go. That should be all the information we need. Now, if we give this a refresh, we should see we have our order ID, our purchased on, and our price page showing up, which looks really good. Now, the next thing I want to do inside of our order information is add a brand new section that's going to be for displaying our product information. So we're going to have a section inside of here, and this is going to be kind of like a card. So I'm going to add some classes onto here for border. We're going to have a solid border. So we'll say border solid, and we're going to say border gray 500, just like that. And also, I want it to be rounded, a pretty large rounding. We'll add some padding into there. And on the medium sizes, we'll add a little bit more padding. And we'll also add some spacing on the top and the bottom of four. So there we go. That's going to essentially give us a card. And inside this card, we can render out an image. And we need to make sure that we use the image component that comes from React email. There we go. So we have our image. For our source, we can't just put our product.image path because this is going to be an image that we can't actually view properly because it's going to be just a partial path. We need the full path, which is why we actually need to get the process.env.next public server URL, just like that. There we go. And then we can actually get our product image. So let's wrap that in there, close off our string, and we make sure that our product has an image path, which is a string. There we go. That's going to render out the image for our particular product. And let's come over to our other types. I'll just close out of all of these tabs for now, make sure I save everything. We'll open up just the things that we're working on for now. So inside of here, our product is going to have an image path. And up here, we're going to have an image path as well. That's going to be a string. And for this image path, I'm essentially just going to copy an image that we already have. So here, I'm just going to copy this exact URL. I want to paste that down into here. And that's going to work just fine. This is just a dot JPEG, I believe. Let me make sure that's correct. Yep, dot JPEG. There we go. So now that we have that image path, that should work fine. If we refresh, we should see our image showing up, but it looks like it's not quite showing up. That's because it's inside the products folder. There we go. That should actually fix it. We just need to put a slash at the front. Now, if I refresh, we should see our image and we can see our image is there. Obviously, we want to add some classes to shrink it down. So let's go ahead and work on that next. For our order information on our image, we're going to add a bunch of class names to this. Namely, actually, we can just add a width of 100%, just like that. And we can also make sure that we give it an alt, which is our product.name. Now, if we give this a refresh, it should shrink our image down drastically. As you can see, it fills just the full container size. Also, we need to add our name to our product. So up here, name is going to be a string, and we're probably going to have our description, so we might as well add that as well. Description is a string. Make sure I put the semicolon in there. I'll copy this over to up here, because we're going to need to have our description which is a string just like that. And here description, we'll just add some description. There we go. It doesn't really matter what that actually says. So now back into our order information, everything should be working and we can work on actually rendering out our content. So we're going to have a row 
add some space onto the top of that. So we'll say margin top is gonna be eight, just so it's spaced out from the actual top image section that we have. And then what I wanna do is I wanna add a column inside of our row. In this column, I'm gonna put a class name here of a line bottom. And for this column, I'm going to have in here some text. We're gonna make this a text that is large, bold font size, remove all the margin from it, except for we'll add margin on the right of four. And this is just going to say the product dot name. There we go. So I'll give that a quick refresh just so we can see what that'll look like. You can see the product name is showing up right there. And again, I'll just remove my image from the screen right now so we can see exactly what everything is looking like. Now we can move on to the next column. Column, just like that. And inside of this column, we essentially want to have our download button. So we're gonna have a button, and this needs to come from React email to make sure everything works properly because buttons inside of emails are essentially just links. So let's add a black background to this. We'll add a white text to it. We'll add some padding on both sides of it, and we'll make it rounded, and we'll make our text a little bit larger. So it's gonna be a relatively large button for us to work with. It'll say download, and we need to specify what the link is for this button because like I said, in emails, buttons are really just links. So our href for this one is going to be our download link. So we can get that process.env and we want to get that public server URL slash products slash download and we want to get that download verification ID. There we go. Give that a quick save. That's our href completely done. That's all of our classes completely done. If we refresh, we should see we have a download button showing up on our page over here. Now to make sure our button shows up on the right, I can go into our column and I can specify the alignment on the right and that'll push our button all the way to the right if I give that a quick refresh, as you can see. And by using align bottom, we pushed our text here to the bottom of our button, which looks really good. Now below that column, we can add in a column for our description. So we can come in here with a column and this one actually is gonna be in its own row. So we're gonna say row. And inside that row, we'll add a column and that is going to have our text. And inside that text, we're gonna have our product dot description. And we'll just add some really simple classes here. Text gray 500, margin bottom zero. And that should be all we need to do to get this order information working. So if we get that a save, you can see our sum description shows up right here and we have our download link. Right now, if I click it, it'll give me the expired link because obviously that link doesn't work. It's just a random ID, but this is what we'll actually send to the user, which looks really good and really clean. So let's go ahead and actually send that email. So if we close out of all of this stuff that we no longer need, and we go into our app and we go to the webhook section, you'll notice here we're sending just a placeholder email. We can replace this with our purchase receipt email just like that. Make sure that I import this properly. There we go. And now all we need to do is pass along our order. We need to pass along our product and we need to pass along our download verification ID, just like that. And that's all the information that we need. Now it looks like this could possibly not work, right? Cause all we need is the ID. So we can just change this to be ID. There we go. So now we're actually passing along everything we need to this purchase receipt email. So if I test purchasing something again, I should get sent an email that looks just like this with a download link. So let's test that. I'm gonna come over here. I'll expand this side of our screen. We'll purchase this very first project. We have a bunch of four twos inside of here. Make sure that we specify an email. And actually, to make this actually work, we'll need to first go to our admin page. So we'll go slash admin, and we need to delete the sale that we already have. So let's say I'm deleting the second one. That way you can repurchase this on this particular user, because otherwise it obviously wouldn't work. So this product called second, we're gonna purchase this. Make sure that we get everything entered in here correctly. Enter our email. There we go. Click on the purchase link. It should redirect us to the page with the download link. And then most importantly, inside my email, I should have this sent to me. And if I open up my email, you can see I get the purchase receipt with our order ID, the purchase date, as well as the price that was paid. You'll notice our image doesn't show up correctly. And that's because we're running things on localhost and my email provider has no access at all to localhost, but this will work in production because obviously your emails or your images will be hosted in a publicly accessible place. I'm just doing this through localhost, which is why the email image does not show up, but that's why it does show up in our testing version, which is why it's really important to have that testing version that you can use. Now we're finally on to the very last section, which is going to be this my orders page, which is just going to send an email to the user with download links, as well as receipts for their different purchases, because you need to have some type of order history for users to look at. So inside of our customer facing section, we need to create a new folder for orders. And inside of here, we'll just create a page .tsx, just like that export default function orders my orders 
page. There we go. And we'll just return h1 says hi for now. Give that a refresh. You can see that that is working. So for this, we're just going to have a really simple card that shows up on the screen inside of a form. So we'll say card, get that from the correct component section. And for our form, I want to make sure that this is not too large. So we'll say max width is going to be extra large and we'll center it with the margin X on auto. So now inside of our card, we're going to have our header for our card, which is going to have a title just like that. This will say my orders. And then we're going to have a card description, which will describe what this form is. Enter your email and we will email you your order history and download links. And the reason we're doing it like this is because we don't have any authentication for our users. So this is going to be the way they authenticate themselves through email. It's much easier than creating your own authentication and gets the exact same purpose across. Now, if you wanted to scale your application and add more things and eventually add authentication, it would be incredibly easy to add because instead of having this my orders page, you would just have a login button that they would click on and then they would have a my orders page that would show them the information. And since all of our emails are written in React, converting our emails to actual pages is really easy. So this is a really easy way to actually get started with this authentication without doing a lot of the hard authentication stuff. Now here's our card content. And inside the card content, we essentially want to create what our form is gonna look like. So we're gonna have a div here that's going to have our form information. We're gonna space these out in the Y direction of two. And then we're gonna have a label and we're gonna have an input just like this. So our label, it's going to say email, make sure we get this imported correctly. Same thing with our input, make sure we import that correctly. Import here, type of email, we're going to have this be required. Name is going to be email, ID is going to be email, and we don't even need to really worry about a placeholder. So we'll just leave that off. And our HTML4 is obviously going to point to that email ID. So now we can see we have our email field right here, which is great. Let's finally add in a card footer. And this will be for a message that we're going to put essentially as well as our submit button. So we'll put in our submit button. The reason I'm creating this in its own component is because I want to be able to actually use some hooks inside of here. So we'll export a function, actually not export. We'll just create a function called submit button, just like that. And the submit button is going to be able to get that pending status from our form because we're going to be using essentially form statuses and so on. So we'll say use form status. There we go. And then we can return our button. Now inside this button, if we are in the pending state, then it'll say sending. Otherwise, it'll say send just like that. And also we're going to add in here some class name. There we go. This is going to be a width of full, size of large, disabled whenever we are pending, and of course, a type of submit. And then we're going to make sure we import our button. There we go. So now we have our button being rendered out right here, which is exactly what we want. We're going to need to make sure that this is a client component. There we go. So you can see that that is working just fine. And then up here is where we can actually set up our form and so on. So let's go ahead and actually create the action for this. So inside of here, we're going to create a brand new folder. This one's going to be called actions slash orders dot TS. And we're actually going to make it a TSX just because we're going to have some JSX inside of here. Now this is going to be a server. So use server export function email order history. And we're going to make this an async function. And this again is going to take in our previous state, which is unknown. That's because this is a server action. And it's going to take in our form data of that type form data. There we go. Make sure I get the correct spelling on that. Now I'm also going to manually specify the return type of this. And that's because this return type is going to return to us a promise that is going to have a message, which is optional and a string, or it's going to have an error that is optional and a string, just like that. Make sure I close all this off. There we go. Perfect. And now what I want to do is actually go through and make sure all of our form stuff we submitted is correct. Like our email is actually correct before we send the email. So first of all, const result is equal to, I want to get an email schema, which is just z.string.email. So we'll put that in its own variable. Email schema, just like that. Make sure we import Zod. There we go. So I can take my email schema. I can safely parse this and I can pass in my form data dot get email because that's the only thing my form is passing up. So this is just going to make sure that my email is valid. So if 
my result.success is equal to false. Well, that means I had an incorrect email being entered, so I can return an error that says invalid email address. There we go. So now it's returning that error down to us. Otherwise, we're obviously gonna return some type of message to the user if we have some type of success. So I'll just leave that blank. Helps us get rid of those errors up there. So now what I wanna do is I want to get my user. So I can say my user is equal to awaiting db.user.find first. And actually we can do find unique since we know that emails are unique. And we wanna get them where our email is our email. And this is coming from our result.data, there we go. And what I want to do is I want to select only the fields that I'm going to need. So I know that I'm going to need my email field, so I'll set that to true. I know that I'm going to need to get information for all of my orders, and I want to select specific information from here. So we need our price paid in cents, we need our ID, we need our created at, and we also need to get the information about each individual product for that order as well. So here, I'm going to select my ID, which is true, my name, There we go, image path, and then finally the description. This is just all the information we're gonna send along inside of our email. You can see this is quite lengthy, but this is just selecting the information we need for our particular user. Now the final thing I need to do is add an order verify or a download verification to each one of these users. So I'm gonna say my orders is my user.orders, just like that. And of course we could have a null user if we entered in an incorrect email. So if our user is equal to null, what I wanna do here is I just wanna to return to us a message. I'm gonna copy this message. And this message is just gonna say, check your email to view your order history and download your products. Now you may be wondering why I'm sending this successful message if the user is not there. And that's because I don't want to tell people whether or not that email actually exists because that could be a security vulnerability since you could tell which emails people have signed up for. So this way I'll never be able to know if this email is actually correct or not. If I'm entering my information, it'll just always say, hey, you entered an email, the email was valid. We don't know if there's a user or not, but just go check your email. It's again, a security precaution. So now what we can do is get our orders from our user. We want to map through them. And for each order, we essentially want to add a brand new download verification to this. So I'm going to return the entirety of my order. And I'm going to add one single thing, which is a download verification ID, just like that. I want to create it. So that's going to be from my DB. So we'll say download verification is DB dot download verification dot create. I'm gonna create a brand new one where the data here expires in 24 hours. So we'll say new date, date dot now, plus 24 times 1000 times 60 times 60. And then we also need to add in the information for our product ID, which is just our order dot product dot ID. There we go. So now here's where we can actually send out our orders from our email. So what we can do is we can say, resend, which we of course need to create all the way at the top here. Const resend equals new resend process dot env dot resend API key as a string. There we go. And now we can send out that email. So down here, resend dot emails dot create and actually we'll do send. And this email is going to be very similar to our other email. It's going to have a from field, which is going to be from support. And then it's going to use whatever email field we specified process dot env dot sender email, just like that. Close that off. We're going to have a to field, which is going to be our user dot email, just like that. And then finally, we're going to have our subject, which is order history. And then finally, our react is just going to be that order history email. So we'll say order history email. And this is a component that we haven't quite created yet, but we'll just render it out like that. Now this email is going to return to us some data. And if that data is an error, make sure we await this up here. Then we know that there was some type of problem sending that email. So if data.error, then we're going to return an error. There was an error sending your email. Please try again. There we go. Otherwise, we'll send down a success message. So I'm just going to copy this message from up here and paste it down there. That's going to be our success message. So now we just need to define what this email is going to look like, and it should send it to the user with all the information that we need. So I'm going to close out of all these different tabs that we have open. I'm going to go to the email section, and I'm going to go down to my order history, and it's going to look very similar to our purchase receipt. So I'm just going to copy this over. This is going to be our order 
history email and the order history email is going to take in some preview props and we have our props up here. So order history email props and order history email props, order history email props. Now for this order history, we obviously need to change our preview to say order history and downloads. There we go. Then inside of here, we want a lot of this to be pretty much the same. The max width is the same. This will say order history instead. And then obviously this order information is going to be looping through a different set of orders. So our props are gonna be slightly different. We're gonna get in an array of orders instead. So up here, we have an array of orders and each one of these orders is gonna contain an ID, which is going to be a string. It's gonna contain a price paid in cents, which is a number. There we go. It's gonna have a created at, which is a date. It's gonna have a download verification ID. I'll just copy that over because that's exactly the same. And then finally, it's going to have a product and it's gonna be all this product information right here. So we can just copy all that over, close all this out, make sure we get all of our parentheses closed off. And as you can see, we now have an orders, which we make sure is an array of these different objects that contains all of this information. We'll come here and fix these preview props in a sec, but down here, we're gonna have our orders. We're gonna map through each order and each order is gonna to return to us one of these order informations. So if we can come in here, the key is gonna be our order.id. We can pass along our order. Our product is just our order.product. And this is our order.download verification ID. So that will give us all the information for each one of our orders. The only other thing I wanna do is I wanna get the index as well from here, just like that. I'm actually gonna put this in a react.fragment. So my key will go on here. There we go. And the reason I wanna do that, if I just remove the key from this, make sure I import React, is that I wanna add an HR at the bottom here. And this HR is specifically coming from React email. And I wanna add it for all the emails except for the last. So if our index is less than orders.length minus one, then I'm gonna render out that HR element. That'll just put a line between each one of our different elements, except for the very last one will not have a line. So now let's fix these preview props. We'll say our orders, it's gonna be an array where we have all these different props. So my ID is going to be a random UUID. So we'll just copy all of this up into here. There we go. We're gonna copy all of our product information into there as well. And then finally, our download verification ID will go up into there as well. Let's remove all this and let's create a second one just so we can test what this will look like with two separate things. So again, we're gonna do this. Same date, doesn't really matter. We'll change the price here to something different. We'll say product name two, some other description and the product path can go to the same exact image or if we want we can select a different image so let's actually copy out a different image go into our public folder and we'll copy this image instead so now we can paste that down here there we go so now hopefully this will show up for us so now if we go over and we look at this we can open up the section for our order history there we go and now you can see we have our order history it tells us the id purchased on price paid and we have the same thing down here for our second product as well. And we have download links for both of them that should work. So now let's test to make sure this works by hooking up all the last remaining pieces that we have. So if we go over to our customer facing section, we have our order page. We need to add an action to our form. And this is going to be an action that we get from that form state hook. So use form state. We're gonna pass in our email order history action and our default prop here is just gonna be an empty object. So we'll say const our data and our action is equal to that. So here's our action. Now let's make sure all of our data is being processed. So if we have errors and so on. So here underneath of our input, I'm gonna add a section to render out our error. So if we have an error inside of a div with the destructive text, so we'll say text destructive in the, there we go. And what I wanna do is I wanna render out my data.error. Close all that off, just like that. So now if we have an error, we'll render it out right here. So let's just type in a completely bogus email address and click send, and you can see it's not working. Let's refresh our page, make sure that this works. So now we'll send a bogus email address, still not quite working, so we have something going on. And I believe what's going on is we're not showing our message anywhere. I wanna show the message down here. So if we have a data.message, then I wanna render out the message. We'll just put it in a paragraph tag. Otherwise, I wanna render out my submit button. So I only wanna show the submit button essentially if I have not successfully submitted. That's just gonna prevent us from spamming the form a little bit too much. So now you can see it's properly saying, check your email to view your order history. 
And that's because we put in a bogus email. It's gonna say that no matter what. Now, if our email is like invalid like this and we submit our form, you're gonna notice it says email, invalid email address, which is great. And now if we submit a real email address, for example, webdevsimplified.com, click send, we see that order history email is not defined. And that's because inside of our code, we forgot to define that. So up here, order history email, let's make sure we import that and we pass in all of our different orders. That should fix that problem, but it looks like our orders are not lining up properly with the type that we specified. I believe the reason for that is our download verification ID. We need to get just the ID. So we're gonna say we want to await this and we wanna get just the ID from that. That should hopefully clean up all of that. And we wanna make sure that this is an asynchronous function just like that. And now all we need to do down here is we need to await promise.all of our different orders, because now that they are asynchronous functions, it's actually turning them into promises, essentially. That actually should hopefully fix this. So if we give this a quick refresh here, enter in the correct email, click send. We should see that it'll say that it's actually sent. You can see it's saying to check my inbox. And if I open up my inbox, you can see I have the order history for both of these products and I can click download and it's gonna redirect me to the download for the first product here as well as for this second product, they are both being redirected properly. So that is working great. And that's how you create a full Next.js e-commerce site from scratch. Now, if you enjoyed this and wanna learn even more about Next.js and some of the more advanced complex topics, I highly recommend checking out my full Next.js simplified course. I'll have it linked down in the description below. It covers everything you need to know about Next.js and makes creating projects like this incredibly easy.